by raising the minimum that a team has to spend because, you know, that's supposed to make every team more competitive and be able to compete for a championship, supposedly. Okay? Uh, that's supposed to entice the LeBron Jameses to want to stay in the Cleveland. Mm, no, I see what you're saying. It's okay. a psychological ploy. See, it's not so much a literal ploy with them, it's a psychological ploy. They figure, well, if we can just make the team better, he won't leave. Okay, okay. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Okay. It ain't about that no more because if you look right now, it's, it's already starting to happen. If you look right now, uh, Chris Paul, knowing that the New Deal is in place, knowing that the New Orleans Hornets have to spend more money, Chris Paul is saying right now to ESPN, I'm not staying here. He's doing. He's saying exactly what LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony said. He's saying, I'm not staying here. When my deal is over, I'm going where I want to go, and where I want to go is New York. He's openly said it a year before his contract. is up. I want to go to New York. You either trade me to New York or you keep me here and you lose everything, you'll be like Cleveland. You'll trade, you you keep me here, I'll play one more year here, I'll leave, and your team will be the worst team in the league after I'm gone. So you either trade me and get something or you let me go and get nothing. I will, I will use an example that's known to almost every sports fan. The L.A. Clippers are notoriously known for losing. They're also notoriously known for operating at a gross profit because they pay a dollar a year in rent because they play in the same stadium as the L.A. Lakers. They pay their players pennies, and they sell out every night because if you live in Los Angeles and you can't afford a Lakers ticket, you can afford a Clippers ticket, uh, Clippers ticket and you get to see every other team in the league. <laughs> so, and, and the Clippers owner knows that, so he keeps his ticket prices low so that his arena sells out regardless of how his team, how his team does plays as payers the lowest in the league and makes a profit of seventy, eighty, ninety million dollars a year. Okay. So he's basically that's what operating Fisher a, went, that's what Derek Fisher is saying at the top. Okay. Okay. He's operating the, a different I guess we're doing the same thing. Right. They're operating at a, a, an extreme profit and it's like the and I I bring up the Clippers because what the Clippers were notorious for doing was if a player, if they drafted a player and he was good and he finally did get to his his original, the NBA has a rookie uh, salary structure. So when you're drafted by a team in the NBA, you're, you're, depending on where you're drafted in the first or second round, your contract is non-negotiable. You're, you're automatically given what you're given um, based on your draft spot. The Clippers are notorious for, like, Blake Griffin is still playing on a rookie contract, which pays him about $4 million a year. When it's up in two years, he's going to ask for an extension of about 12 or $13 million a season. The Clippers are not going to give it to him. And he'll end up playing for somebody else. They'll draft somebody else, and they'll repeat the process. The third time was a charm. After two failed attempts to trade superstar Chris Paul to L.A., the Hornets finally succeeded. So one of the greatest athletes to ever represent New Orleans is officially a member of the Los Angeles Clippers. Paul requested a trade away from New Orleans two weeks ago. Hornets general manager Del Demps worked out a deal to send CP3 to the L.A. Lakers last week, only to have that deal voided by NBA Commissioner David Stern. Greetings. This is the Counter-Racist Evolving Engineer Program, C-R-E-E. -E. That's the acronym for the program, and that is my handle. Today is December 24, 2011, and again, we get to have Mr. Richard Lawrence, who is a graduate of Hampton University out of Virginia, which is a historically black college and university, or one of those, and uh, he has a degree in sports management with a minor in finance, and he is also the founder and administrator of a Facebook page entitled Young, Black, and Married, and that is linked on the episode page. And so I wanted to have him back to just pick up where we left off, which was this negotiation, this power struggle uh, that is really the continuation of the saga of LeBron James leaving the Cleveland plantation for the Miami plantation against the wishes of 
racist suspects at the very least, and to some people, uh, demonstrated racist. And uh, I had no idea. I didn't, I didn't know who Chris Paul was, had no clue, and had never heard the name. And I just thought it was very prescient the way that Mr. Lawrence was able to kind of lock that all together and really set up, uh, un, unbeknownst to me, a segue for this program today. So first of all, welcome again, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you uh, having me the first time and having me back again. You know, as I had said to you right before we went on the air, I got a lot of feedback from that. Uh, folks really felt that was extremely constructive, very informative. Let them kind of get their bear bearings. I know it was for me in terms of um, just the stuff we never think about or didn't know about. You really, um, you really, you brought it. You brought the information and helped us understand how the dots were connected. And so I guess um, I want to go to the ABCs. And I guess first thing I want to say is that we're going to speak with you for about an hour. Okay. That's the plan. And then at the end of the first hour, we have invited two other panelists who have been keeping up with this and kind of keep, keep up, obviously, every day with um, racism and counter-racism. And that would be D-Train, who is a host right here on Blog Talk Radio of a program entitled Reckless 2.0, which is also linked on the episode page. And longtime listener and loyal uh, supporter, M1, you will often hear him call into the program entitled The Context of White Supremacy, which is on another venue, and I'm going to venture forth to simply say uh, what venue that is now, and whatever the folks at Blog Talk Radio want to do about that, they will do. The Context of White Supremacy can be found on TalkShoe. I think they're still working on getting their own uh, their own website, but for right now you can find them on TalkShoe, and it is by far the uh, class of the field in terms of counter-racism uh, broadcasting and, and, and radio programs. He's done I, I, probably close to 600 programs now with uh, such a wide variety of uh, experts. But that having been said, let's get started. So, like I, like I like to say, the ABCs of it. Okay, so where I got that you had explained to us was that uh, this was all set up when LeBron James, Chris Bosh, and Dwayne Wade at the end of the 2009-2010 season, decided that they all wanted to play together. Um, money was a secondary <clears throat> consideration, but it had always been uh, a, an unspoken standard within the NBA that players were supposed to stay where they were put. And specifically, even though it wasn't really said, black players were supposed to stay where they were put. And uh, it was simply called loyalty, but that's that was just a euphemism for that. And so LeBron James broke that unspoken rule, and he he went, and we all know the hullabaloo that ensued. And so there was a response on the other side of the chessboard, and the response on the other side of the chessboard was this NBA lockout, and the idea was to try to put in place some things that would keep that from ever happening again, whereby somehow uh, the rules were not that the racists uh, put in place, to keep their boys playing where they wanted them to play um, uh, wouldn't be broken again. And so you were explaining about the salary salary caps and how the salary caps were supposed to make that happen. And then as I played in the clip before we you know, uh, got on the air again live here today, um, you, you forecasted that that wasn't going to stop them. And you said, hey, Chris Paul has already said, he already knows what's in place. But Chris Paul, who plays for the New Orleans or did play for the New Orleans Hornets, had said, I want to go. I want to go just like Carmelo Anthony did. I want to go just the way LeBron James did. This is a new era. You can't hold me. I'm out of here. And I want to go to New York. And so that would bring us up to date. He is now in a, uh, in a L.A. Clippers uniform, which is the losingest team in maybe sports history, certainly um, call. Uh, professional basketball history, and I'm trying to figure out how we get from, hey, I want to go to New York to, oh, well, now I want to go to L.A., oh, I can't go to L.A., now I'm in the Clippers, and David Stern somehow got involved. David Stern stopped it. I don't get any of it. I don't see how he didn't end up in New York. I don't understand what David Stern had to do with it. I've never heard of David Stern being involved in trades before. Can you explain this whole big mess to us? Yes, I can. Um, first, let me start in a different sport, um, it's not, it is very relevant to the NBA. Um, Albert Pujols, 
in baseball. Uh, the St. Louis Cardinals just won a World Series, their first World Series, and I'm, I am not a baseball fan, but I believe about 50 years. Um, he's the most famous baseball player in the world. He's the best baseball player in the world. He just signed a 200, almost $250 million contract with the Anaheim Angels, 10 seasons for 10 years, 200, close to $250 million, so about $25 million a season, which is a, a lot of money, obviously. Uh, about 10 to anywhere from 8 to $10 million more than any NBA player can currently make because of the NBA salary cap. That is because baseball doesn't have a salary cap. And if you want the best baseball player to play for your team, you have to outbid like an auction. If I go to an auction and I want that paying on the wall, I have to outbid everybody in the, everybody sitting next to me. And it's the same way in baseball. If you want the best player, you have to outbid. So essentially, Albert Pujols sets his own market value by his level of talent. The NBA does not allow players to do that. Uh, the best a player in the NBA can make is $80 million over the course of seven, eight years. Um, that is standard NBA operating procedure. That's a standard contract in the NBA. That's the contract that Carmelo Anthony has, Dwayne Wade has, LeBron James has. If you're a player of that caliber, that's the contract that you play under. Um, and for no more. Now, it wasn't always that way in the NBA. A solder cap didn't exist in the NBA until about 1982. Prior to that, you in the NBA, just like every other league, you had to bid um, market value for a player. Chris Paul ended up in a Clippers uniform because the Hornets are currently owned by the NBA. The New Orleans Hornets are owned by the NBA because their previous owners ran into financial problems and filed bankruptcy and sold the team. Um, the NBA had to take over ownership of the team because there was they had the funds to do it. Um, it's not unprecedented in sports. It's happened in other leagues where the league will take ownership of a team for a brief time until they can find a new owner. Now that's where Chris Paul wanting to leave the team comes in. If their best player leaves, then they are not sellable. You can't sell a team that wins 10 or 15 games. So the NBA essentially held up the Los Angeles Lakers and then the L.A. Clippers and basically for ransom and said, if you want Chris Paul, we need literally half of your team back. And if you know basketball and you can look at the roster of the L.A. Clippers prior to Chris Paul's trade, they did end up getting the best player in the deal, so they're not going to complain, but they gave up five or six players who are under the age of 25 who they really wanted to keep. That's what the New Orleans Hornets, that's why David Stern canceled the trade originally to the Lakers and the first trade to the Clippers because he felt they weren't getting enough that would make them want to, although that was never announced publicly, that would make anybody want to buy the Hornets without Chris Paul. So essentially, Chris Paul was being used as a pawn. He knew that, and he refused to be used as a pawn. In order to get out of New Orleans, he waived. What, what Chris Paul has is a player uh, player option in his contract. He has, after this season, he can either opt out of his last year in his contract or he can choose to stay in it. What he basically did for the Clippers was say, I will not opt out. I will play for you for the next two years. But he did not guarantee them any more than those two years, which is the exact same time I believe that Greg, Blake Griffin's rookie contract ends. If the Clippers can win a title within two years before the, both those contracts end, I will still I will go on record and say that they will not resign either player. <laughs> they basically took Chris Paul at a discounted rate because wow. his next contract will pay him more. They get him for two years. Um, which is which was fine for him because he didn't want to be in New Orleans. So he said, "Okay, fine. You don't want to let me go. I'll take. I'll just get out of town. I don't want to be in town, so I'll go wherever I can. You won't let me go to New York, but I only have to play two two years and for the Clippers. So I'll agree to play two years for them. There's still no guarantee that in three years he won't end up in New York Knicks uniform. So he's playing the game within the game because that's what he has to do. I realize that." the NBA was playing a serious game with him 
basically because without Chris Paul, the Hornets are worthless. Um. Okay. T- I, I'm maybe I'm I'm real slow on this. My my basketball IQ, my sports IQ is 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 pretty low. No, no. Go ahead. So I'm not okay. He didn't get to go to New York because okay. I get that the Hornets are a worthless team without him. I get that part. Right. Now, I guess the part I don't get is um, if that's true, why did they let him go at all? Because what they were able to get from the Clippers the second time, not the first time, <laughs> what they were able – essentially the Clippers second the, – the, the trades, because it really come down to two people now. Uh, originally, this was all about Chris Paul. Then it became about Chris Paul and another player, Eric Gordon. Eric Gordon is a phenomenal 23-year-old young player, not as good as Chris Paul or LeBron James or Carmelo Anthony, but about the next level down. So now that the New Orleans Hornets have Eric Gordon, they're still a sellable team. Okay, and then my next question is, since they were able to make a deal with the Clippers, why couldn't they make some sort of deal with the Lakers? Because what they wanted from the Lakers was actually a good was a good basketball deal, but the problem became many of the owners in basketball are not basketball people, they're business people. Um, now, it's funny because what you're not going to hear is the man who actually made all these deals that David Stern canceled is a black man who works for the NBA. Oh. He was very pissed about all these cancel- cancellations because when he, when the NBA took ownership of the Hornets, David Stern told him, you have autonomy in how you run the team. So he made these deals. And essentially they were saying to him, well, these deals aren't good enough. They were basically questioning his judgment, and he's a basketball professional. So okay. that that's a story you will not hear, and I, I – I, Obviously, being a person who made it in the sport of management, I subscribe to a lot of sports journals that focus only on the business side of sports. And I've read that a lot over the last two weeks, that he is incensed that, um, and I cannot remember a man's name. If I was sitting at a computer, I would Google it right now. Um, but he's incensed at David Stern because, you know, the first deal that he got from the Lakers included Lamar Odom, um, and a few other players coming from other teams. It was a three-team trade originally. Um, it was a good basketball deal. It would have made the Hornets a competitive basketball team. But Lamar Odom's 30 years old. And the majority of the other players they would have gotten are 30 years old. That's what David Stern nixed it for. He nixed it because Eric Gordon was the, basically the player they did get. The original Clippers deal did not include Eric Gordon. The Clippers were trying to retain their best player pre the Chris Paul trade and get Chris Paul. That's why that trade got canceled. Essentially, the league also held up the L.A. Clippers. So, really, they only gave him because they're getting Chris Paul, and he's a big name. He'll sell tickets. So, at least in two years, if they don't win any games, they'll sell out tickets, and they're going to raise their ticket prices. Um, I've read that. They're, as soon as they traded for Chris Paul, they've agreed to raise their ticket prices this year. Um, so it's not a bad deal for them financially, taking on a player who makes more money. But what happened is Eric Gordon became the new pawn because he's 23 years old. And essentially years down the line, New Orleans will try to put him in the same position they put Chris Paul in. Because if Eric Gordon was to leave the New Orleans Hornets in two or three years when his contract's up, same situation happens. They're not a good team without Eric Gordon. Um, I believe Eric Gordon three or four years ago was like the third or fourth pick in the NBA draft. So he's a you know a high quality, high value young player. Being 23 years old, nobody knows whether or not he's reached his potential. He could end up being a, a Dwayne Wade quality player, and that's why he was essentially forced to be included in the deal for Chris Paul. The Knicks, where Chris Paul wanted to go would never commit to doing a trade for him because they have a good team and they are unwilling to give up. They were gonna, they were not willing to play ransom games with the NBA, essentially. They have too good a team to do that already. They figure they can just wait out the two years until he's a free agent because that's still where he wants to go. Um, the Lakers, 
they really got, to be honest, the Lakers got the worst of this entire situation because they made a good business move that was canceled out by the NBA because it would have made them too good. The fear Um, was that if the Lakers could get Chris Paul, that fans would have a backlash towards the NBA like when like when the Heat got LeBron James. Um, here goes the Lake here goes the Lakers again loading up on the most talented players. Here goes the best team in the league loading up on the best players. So that's why that trade was canceled. But okay, if you're no. looking at it from a you know a, ben, a Lakers standpoint, their owner um because you know it's weird, it is it's funny. There are owners in the NBA who could care less about a salary cap. Because they want to win. So if they had to spend $300 million to get LeBron James, they would. The, but the, the, the backlash <laughs> issue. The backlash issue. Because, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying about it being a backlash because the, all of the good players are loading up on one team. I hear that. But I, I was never clear that, that that was the real reason for the quote-unquote backlash there were a lot of people who were not upset about it at all. They were they were happy to see exactly. all that talent. The I only people that I real heard saying it was, fan was ecstatic. I believe a lot of white people were mad. <laughs> so it, right, because so it wasn't really a basketball issue. It was a racism issue, and it was, it was covered as a basketball issue. Right. Yeah. So that I mean, no, a, no basketball fan. I'm not a LeBron James fan. I'm a Chicago Bulls fan, so I could have cared less when he went to Miami. Um. But it didn't make me mad either because as a basketball fan, I can look at a player and say, why wouldn't he want to play with, one, his friend, two, one of the best players in the league. (laughs) I I played basketball uh, all through high school in my first year or two in college. I would have done the same thing as a basketball player. So there should have never been a backlash towards him, nor should there have have ever been one towards Chris Paul had he ended up a Laker. But there would have been from white people, as you said, who would have covered it up like it, like they were mad about a basketball decision when really it's just a race decision. You're mad because – and I brought up Albert Pujols to begin with because he literally left his team in St. Louis, the team that drafted him, the team that brought him up and, and trained him and made him – helped make him the best basketball player in the world. And he left them not two months after they won a World Series to go to another team. And nobody has said, oh, he's a traitor. He's this, he's that, he's, and he's a minority, but he's also a very, very light-skinned Hispanic, and it, and it's not, it's, it's law, it's, well, he's not as light as Alex Rodriguez, but he's still a lighter Hispanic, lighter than uh, Mariano Rivera, for example. So it's, it dawns on me that when, you know, that skin color is a very important factor in oh, yeah. these issues. They, they see the dark skin making a decision that they don't believe we're qualified to make, and they attack them, and, and, you know, Chris Paul really got a short end of the stick in this whole situation because, like I said before, he was just a pawn. The only reason why the New York New Orleans Hornets want him so bad is because they want to sell that team. Can, 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 can I offer something as somebody who doesn't know so so much about sports and, and I'll have you dissect this for me? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm, I'm anxious to sort of get out of the discussion and let the guys take it over. Um I posted the pics that I did on this episode because obviously I could have posted pics of Dwayne Wade playing in his uniform, LeBron James in his uniform playing on the court. Same thing with Chris Paul. All of them are known as basketball players. You would, most of the pictures that are available on the Internet are of them in their athletic uniforms playing their sport. I deliberately chose different pics. I chose to have them standing beside their chosen mates and with their offspring. And the reason I did that is because as somebody who's not like a basketball person, the way that it looks to me is that they wanted to humiliate this man, uh, Chris Paul. And that's why I said, you know, in the uh, show description that this was the public abuse. It was the public making of a boy. You know, it's like under white supremacy, any black male who tries to act as a man, meaning, as Mr. Fuller would say, to manage his own affairs, 
will be slapped back into place and made to know that he is a boy. You think you can make a decision and say two years ahead of time that you will or will not work here. But boy, if we tell you that you're not going to leave, we'll decide where you're going to leave and where you're going to go. And in that way, I thought he was abused because he is, you know, he's quote unquote a married man. That's why I put that pick up there of his brown skinned mate. And, and I think this is something that all three of these uh, gentlemen have in common. They are not dating or married to non-black females. Not, they're not even dating or are married to light-skinned uh, black females. They are devoted to them. There's no history on the ca in the case of either Mr. Paul nor Mr. James, which is really spectacular because if there was any, it would be out there, of them uh, having any degree of infidelity. They've been very loyal. They're very devoted to their offspring, and all of them have male offspring. As far as I know, no female offspring. And the reason I say that is because I believe with all of my heart that had President Obama had male offspring, there is no way in the world he would be president today. So here you have these black males who are trying to be and, you know, as someone who's the founder and administrator of Young, Black, and Married, who are trying to be, trying to be family men, trying to create a financial legacy for their attempted wives and their attempted family and their offspring. And they're being slapped around and, 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 and treated like runaway slaves and boys. And I think that to some degree, I, I, I think that is a lot of what, uh, you know, certainly skin color has a lot to do with it. I've had William Darity, who's an economist out of Duke University on, and he has done a groundbreaking and irrefutable study study that shows that skin color is extremely important, especially when it comes to earnings, that when it comes to skin color, the very lightest people who are classified as black make the same amount of money as white people as, and when you're talking about males, which is astounding to people. So yeah, it has a lot to do with it. So I guess what I'm saying is a person who doesn't follow basketball, it seems less about the making of a pawn in a business decision than it did about needing to put in his place, put Chris Paul in his place in the way that they thought they had put LeBron James and anybody who aspired to be like him in his place after having done what he did. I know that was kind of long-winded, but did, no, did I what see, I just I, say make sense? I, I agree. Yes, it does, and I agree with everything you're saying. Um, I bring it, and I really wish I had his name. Um, I will try to get that name to you um, so that you can post it to your program. But I really believe that although Chris Paul t publicly took it, the person that David Stern was really doing everything you just described to was the man who actually made the trade because he mm -hmm. is a black he is a black man and he does run the New Orleans Hornets and from the the and this is just the buzz um, SportingNews dot com is is a uh, industry uh, trade magazine that sports professionals uh, read, talks a lot about contracts and stuff like that, of that nature. Um, but there are a lot of articles on that website talking about how that man had basically done the best that he could with a team, you know, that really didn't have much assets. It's, the Hornets are not a good team. They were in the playoffs last year, but that was a large part due to Chris Paul. They're not really a good basketball team. And the trade to the Lakers was actually the best basketball trade it would have made the Hornets a the most competitive team they could have been. Um, so he was extremely upset because if that is what the league just had this lockout for, was to make teams competitive. And if that was the whole quote-unquote premise of everything, then essentially you're a liar, was what he was saying to David Stern, how he felt in, in the articles that I read, because, you know, I did that. I made the team. I made moves to make the team competitive. And you basically said, no, uh, you, your moves aren't good enough, or they, they don't cover. And, and to me, and that is even more egregious in this sense, because you know that, that's just because they have they're my personal uh, role models as a young black male in that business. But the three people most rumored to replace David Stern, who is rumored to leave his position in the next twelve to eight, twenty four months, he's not going to be NBA commissioner long. And that's why these moves are so, to me, so blatant. Um, because the the people, the three people rumored to be next in line to take David Stern's position are all black men. 
Wow. The current, the current director really? of operations for the Memphis Grizzlies, the current director of operations for the, um, I believe, the Houston Rockets, and the man who runs the New Orleans Hornets right now. Though they are the men, they have uh, the the man who runs the Grizzlies, I, and um, you know the, they're not even they're not they are people. If you look um, years ago, this is how I was put on to them. But years ago, about ten years ago, I was in college. So I was about a, about ten years ago. Um, Black Enterprise ran an article on these men, and these are men with Yale degrees and Harvard degrees and dual degrees in business and and law and very accomplished men. And one, um, the man who runs the director of business operations for the Grizzlies, he actually ran a minor league, which is now the um, the, the NBA Development League, their minor league. But uh, at that time, it was called the um, CBA, um, the Continental Basketball Association. For about eight years, he actually ran the Continental Basketball Association and turned them into a profitable enterprise that the NBA then bought from him. Um, he was also one of the owners of that uh, basketball association. So these are these are men who are more than capable of taking David Stern's position. And in the last year or two of David Stern being in his position, he's making some very drastic measures that even industry professionals are questioning. He, he's, he, it's, it's being rumored that he is power drunk. He is the typical massa who thinks he's, he built this enterprise. Not that the enterprise was built on the talent of these young, predominantly black men. And this was what lead people to believe was the reason he vetoed these decisions because they are unprecedented, even in the NBA, even in sports, period. It's unprecedented for a lead to cancel a trade. Normally, a commissioner's role, a lot of people misunderstand a commissioner's role. David Stern is, no, David Stern is an employee. He can be fired in a moment's notice. If the 30 NBA owners, he's no different than a, than a chairperson, a CEO. If the 30 NBA owners got together and said, we don't want David Stern anymore, then he would be gone. And there has been talk that there have been NBA owners because the Lakers owner was not happy about the cancellation of the trade, and neither was the Clippers owner about the second, the first cancellation of the trade. There's been talk amongst NBA owners of removing David Stern. He's getting power drunk. He thinks he's bigger than the league. And I believe that you know these moves that all these moves that have been in the news lately are very weird as business moves. They're not business smart. And David Stern has made a reputation for being a brilliant businessman, so I believe he's power drunk. And I believe that he is trying to do everything that you just described. He step on the throat, and I don't necessarily believe it's on the throat of the player. The next, more than likely, the next, um, the next commissioner of the NBA will be black. And I truly believe he's trying, in his mind, to leave a legacy that will never be forgotten. But nobody remembers commissioners. Nobody watches a, a sport for the commissioner. And five or ten years of when David Stern is not commissioner anymore, he will be forgotten. And I believe a lot of what he's doing right now is to try to make an impression. And what he's, in the way he's trying to make an impression is literally stepping on the necks of just too many people, and, you know, it, it's baffling to me because it's hurting the league in and of itself. Um, and that's the talk amongst, quote, unquote, professionals. That is very, what he's doing is very hurtful to the league, to the image of his players. It's, he's left basically Chris Paul out there to look greedy to some people. They would assume, you know, why he makes fifteen million dollars a season? What is he so unhappy about? But he knows that he works for a team that has no owner, that has no goal or plan for the future. Why would he want to stay there? Why would anybody want to stay in a situation like that? In any situation in business or life, where there's no certainty. So he's only making a smart business decision, and like you said, he's being cast in a weird light for making a smart business decision. And, you know, I, I'm interested to see how this plays out as the season drives on. I'm really interested to see if David Starr makes it. Program ID. This is the Counter Racist Evolving Engineer Program. We're chatting this evening with Mr. Richard Lawrence, who is a sports management professional, and we're chatting about the events surrounding Chris Paul and the trades that were denied for him to get out of 
uh, his contract or to get out of his um, role as a player with the New Orleans Hornets and how he ended up with the heretofore worst team in the league, the L.A. Clippers. Uh, let me ask you this. Number one, would you agree that if that is what D David Stern is up to, that he is being a smart businessman, if the business he's really trying to transact is the biggest one on the planet, and that is the business of racism and white supremacy, is he getting a threefer or a twofer? In other words, he gets to humiliate Chris Paul. He gets to humiliate whoever is the aspirant or the uh, next in line to be the commissioner of the NBA, which is more than likely going to be a black male. He gets to, uh, to humiliate the person who is now the, um, what is, I guess, the manager of, the managing owner of the New, New Orleans Hornets. And even uh, I would say maybe uh, he's getting a, a, quadra, uh, a quadra smash. Because the other thing that hasn't been mentioned is that when I looked at the little news clip about Chris Paul leaving New Orleans, Chris Paul was known to be a big advocate for all of the black victims of Katrina in New Orleans. He gave a lot of money and put in a lot of time. You know, that combined with the fact that he's married to a brown-skinned female, has not been seen doing anything other than that, has a black male child. I don't, it just seems like that's more, and then him saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm a man, aren't I? I've done what I, I do what I do for principle, and I'm now I'm getting ready to leave. I'm I've, I've done what I can do in New York, and I'm sorry, New Orleans, and I'm leaving. Just want to let everybody know now I'm I'm leaving. I'm a star player, and I'm out of here. And that just seemed to be more than David Stern and cohorts could take. And I think I started out by saying, let me ask you this question, but I'm rambling some, and uh, hopefully I can fold it all into a question. Uh, he said. Um, I'm, I'm uh, lost my train of thought. He said, "I'm leaving. I want to go where I want to go." Um, maybe, maybe the reason I can't remember the other part that I wanted to say is because I should leave it right there and let you respond. Well, I, I mean, I really think you know you are you are you are tying it together. And like I said, I'm not. <laughs> I've never been a, 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 a quote unquote conspiracy theory. But if I look at this, I can only look at it in one rational way. And part of me wonders if David Stern isn't trying to. You know, not publicly per se, because they're not publicly known figures, but inside the business, especially this one man who, you know, who's running the Hornets right now, you're undermining his decisions as if they're not good. So if you're undermining his decisions, you're essentially saying he's not qualified to run the league. And you're essentially undermining him. And, you know, I, I, I wonder. It makes me wonder because, and like I said, I, I picked up Black Enterprise 10 years ago and saw, okay, they, you know, they named these two men. Um, and I, let me let me correct myself, and I'm sitting at a computer right now because I really want to give their names. They are, I believe, men that everybody who, any black man who watches sports should know their name. Um, but I read an article about these two men years ago and 10 years ago about them being the main one in line to replace David Stern, it makes me wonder whether or not he will be replaced by a black man at all. Right. You, right. you understand what I'm saying? Uh, it, it, makes me, it truly makes me wonder whether or, not, whether or not they won't find some way for a white man to continue to run that league. It, it, but, I, I can't imagine a, 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 them being able to, to stomach handing I, over... You know, especially if the season in where the white guy get hands over the big golden ball to another white man. <laughs> I just right. can't see them changing that moment to a black man holding the big ball and handing it I mean, it, to it would be a major, it would be in in the, the not even, because that, that wouldn't be a sports decision. That would be a major accomplishment in business of, in and of itself for any black person to literally run one of the biggest institutions in the country. Right, especially yeah, because so <laughs> And, you know, and I've, I've literally, as a young man, I've set my life, not my life per se, but my professional goals toward believing that we had, that if we were good enough, we could make it to the highest point. And now it makes me wonder, will they still find a way? 
Right. Well, as, as, as the host of another program would say, that's a Francis Welsing moment. And it is also, to me, a quasi-Obama moment. I mean, because, like, people, they're saying, and this one comes from Neely Fuller Jr., and it pertains to your saying, I don't understand these are not good business moves, nor are these good basketball moves. And Neely Fuller often says that if you do not understand racism, which is white supremacy, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. So it's like, yes, if you follow the basketball of it if I, as I'm listening to you, if you follow the business side of the basketball of it as I'm listening to you, it doesn't make any sense. But if you follow the business of the system of white supremacy, it makes an awful lot of sense. I sure didn't, I sure didn't know that the person who was running the New Orleans uh, franchise was a black man. And by invalidating the decisions that this man is making, it's like a sort of a military model, which is that you're basically saying he's not fit to lead, right? Exactly. exactly. And so how is he going to progress upward? And, and that's my, that would be my major question. Um, because you just pose everything that went through my mind because that just seems, that seems to be, and like I said, as I've read articles on, you know, on the quote unquote industry insiders, that is exactly the questions they have posed. You're basically looking at this man and saying, you're not qualified. When every sports journalist and columnist can, you know, look at the original trade and say, this was a good deal. So, David Stern, what are you doing? And I have seen a black person, a black columnist, um, make the connection that you just made. Um, that it was, uh, it was a complete power trip. And, and, and he said, and, and I, you know, I, I can't quote his name, but I can't quote his, his words. He said the only thing that's not making him go to say that it's a, he said he's about 75% short that it's racist. And he said only 20, and only reserving 25% because he's not, he, he can allow himself to give David Stern credit in one aspect, the NBA. And this is what David Stern has gotten, had, did do for the NBA. When he became commissioner of the NBA, he took them from a league whose championship games were broadcast at midnight on tape delay to being broadcast live in front of millions and millions of people. So he did do that. He did a lot of things that were brilliant businessly, which makes everybody look at his moves now and say, there's only one blatant reason why these, why you're doing this, and it ain't business. So it's got to be racism. And, you know, publicly, I, I know why our brother wouldn't want to make that on his, on his you know, on his Washington sure. Post column. But sure. I, I can you I can read between the lines and realize that he drew that connection and I've drawn it in my head, too, and with everything that you're saying, I, I fully agree because, you know, like I said, their names only escape me right now, and I'm looking for them as we speak, but I know their position and I know who they are, and anybody who was interested and went to Google could find these men's names without much research. Um, but the man running the New York Knicks is a black man. The man running the Memphis Grizzlies is a black man. The man running the New York Orleans Hornets is a black man. And when you look at these decisions, I truly believe, and I don't mean running these teams in terms, of, in terms of going out and finding players. I mean running the businesses of these teams, running the money, setting the ticket prices, that kind of stuff. They are running the business in these teams. And I believe there have been decisions, not just this year, there are ones that are not as relevant as glaring, but going back years, that have shown a very big, I don't know, distrust, um, disbelief in those teams and in those men by extension. And, you know, and it's just gotten egregious in the last month or so. Let me ask you if you think it's a matter of distrust or do you think it's a matter of just out-and-out out sabotage? In other words, it's not so much that they don't trust them to make good basketball business decisions. It's just that they cannot stomach uh, a black male exercising any kind of power. I think they I think it's that. I I do think it's that what you just said and I think that they that the decisions those men have made have been too good. Right. And um, and, 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 he, and and here, you know, when you say, well, there's talk about 
people are dissatisfied with Stern and Stern's most recent unprecedented decisions. But I also heard in that same clip that I mentioned to you when I learned of this Chris Paul thing that several league owners called David Stern to say, you must intervene. You, yes. He was uh, actually... Cleveland no, owner was the first one to call. <laughs> Cleveland was a... There you go. And Mark Cuban, I heard, was one of them as well, the, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. <laughs> yes, he was. Um, actually, Mark Cuban, and, and that was... Um, he did call David Stern, but it was... And I, I, I hated the fact of how that was kind of reported... He called David Stern to yell at David Stern for canceling the first trade. Oh. Because, oh. and I understand that. In, in this sense, it, he's looking out for the welfare of his his product. Um, that sets uh, what David Stern did set a bad precedent because he's an NC saying to the Lakers, I'm not going to let a good team get better. Well, Mark Cuban has a good team. So if you're going to do that to the Lakers, you're going to do it to me too? And that was his reason for calling David Stern, not so much that he cared about Chris Paul. Um, but his phone call to Chris, uh, to David Stern stopped a day later when he got Lamar Odom from the Lakers. So. <laughs> okay, okay. I must have misheard it. No, and, uh, it's not, that's not your fault because it wasn't reported well from what I, from every article that I read. Um, it made it seem, it, it made it seem as if the owners were in support of Stern. Not every owner was. Um, particularly the Lakers owner, who is still mad. And there was even talk, although it was quiet, of bringing an antitrust lawsuit against the NBA. A, a second one? Because I know the first one, that, that was made as the decertify the union to have an mm -hmm. antitrust. So yeah, what is it? Yeah, the, owner, the, the Lakers owner was thinking about bringing one. Wow. Because wow. Because he, like he felt like other owners were in collusion with David Stern to stop his team from continuing to win. Um, so that move, he, David Stern, he, in my mind, he directly spat on some people, and he also indirectly, that's why I say I wonder how long he'll last. He indirectly spat on white men, and white men don't care about color. They do care about money when it comes to each other. And you, him being white isn't going to save his behind if he calls somebody else money, another white man money. And he that's what he's doing right now. And he, you know, and at the end of the day, he, like I said, he's an employee, so he gets a salary from them out of the owner's pockets, just like every other player. That's one thing people, will, I think they don't know. David Stern, because this is this is what uh, what infuriated some players um, years ago when the NFL had a, a lockout. Their commissioner said, "Well, if the players won't be paid, I won't accept a pay either." And, and the commissioner said, you know, while, I'm, while we might be at opposite sides of the table, we're both in the same company. So I don't deserve a paycheck if they're not getting one. And Stern would never say that. <laughs> he continued to be paid the entire time throughout the lockout. And, you know, so it's never it, – it, it's now that there are owners who are looking at him. Like, like I said, he thinks he's bigger than the league. And, it, you know, I believe he's going to start a pissing contest, excuse my language, with the other white men um, who are in his or are in his country club, in a, in a lack of a better term. Huh. And I just think these black men have been dragged into something with, you know, like you, said, with, like you alluded to, little care and little regard for... Anything like you say, Chris Paul, you know, doesn't owe the city of New Orleans anything. He he has helped that community greatly, and I, I refuse to believe that just because he plays in a different uniform, he'll stop doing the things that he's done for the community. So he doesn't owe New Orleans anything. Him wanting to leave, you know, LeBron James doesn't owe Cleveland anything. From the day the Cleveland Cavaliers got LeBron James, he added about an extra three hundred million dollars to the city economy. So these men have done for these cities, and whether directly or indirectly, they don't owe these cities anything. They should be able to go where they want. And like you said, they're grown men. What grown man wants to be told what he can and can't do by another man? 
And, you know, and I look at another sport, baseball, and it's funny to me, they have that freedom in baseball, but baseball is also the, other than hockey, the sport with the largest amount of white players. That's true. Now, this is probably a good segue to go ahead and, and bring the other panel members on, because I am certainly at the complete outer limits of my knowledge of this. So uh, I know that we have one hand raised. If that happens to be the invited panel member, I want to take their call. If you're not part of the panel, that doesn't mean I'm going to. Uh, we're not going to take your call. I uh, just want to make sure I bring the formal panel members on first. And so let's uh, let's see if we we have them here. If you are eight zero one seven, I'm hoping you are either M one, but most likely D train. Uh, your mic is open. Eight zero one seven. Is that you, D train? Okay. I'm assuming not. I will close your mic for right now. You do have your hand up. You did press one, so I'll come back to you. Let me see who's at. Two seven three six. Seven three six. Are you either M one or D train? Hey, great, D. Excellent. Hey, D. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to be quiet and uh, just let you and Mr. Lawrence have at. How you doing, Lawrence? How you doing, uh, Mr. Lawrence? Um, I definitely appreciate the discussion today, and I was uh, quite thrilled to participate because uh, I do see. Um, a lot of, I guess, racial elements playing into this um, into this Chris Paul situation. Um, have you um, have you heard about where uh, Magic Johnson the other day commented? Um, I guess he was defending David Stern. I guess yeah, I some did. people had accused him of being racist. Yeah, Magic I did. Johnson was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't have quite it. <laughs> That frustrated me. I, I <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I also know that Magic is trying to become an NBA owner too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt. M1 has just joined. I just want to let you know that M1 is now on the uh, on the line. So uh, if you could welcome him him to the conversation, and the three of you are are live. Hey. Uh, good, good evening to everybody. Good evening. Yeah. How are you doing? Yes, uh, I'm glad that uh, we are revisiting this topic because when I posted on Creed's blog the uh, Chris Paul situation, it just further proved to me that, you know, this was really all about power struggle. And as, as I told you, I mean, the ink wasn't even dry on these contracts and this heinous move happening to Chris Paul. And and when I ask people, when you look at the disrespect being given to LeBron James, Chris Paul, there was some disrespect to Alpha Pujols, not as intense as LeBron James, but it was done. And the baseball player, Carl Crawford, earlier this year. Yes, yes. I always ask these people, isn't this supposed to be, isn't this supposed to be what made this country great? You hear all the time, the capitalists, Capitalism, the free market, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit is what made this country the greatest on earth. Well, I, I, if, I'm laughing because I, I I literally said the same thing to Cree the last show. <laughs> but it's always a double standard when it comes to the brothers. Though. Yeah, and and you see, and I can see if these are negative men, but everything about them. Suggest they are positive on all levels. On all fronts, right. So, you know, like I said, again, if, if if not racism, then support their decisions in the free market because that's that to me is what this is all about. I mean, they should be able to go wherever they want 
on their terms. Even if it's less money or more money, it's their terms. And, and, and they should not be vilified for it. You know, and <laughs> and it's just, and I said, it's just, you know, quite interesting that uh, that this that that these incidents happen, and I do, and I do believe they're going to happen on a larger scale. I agree. I have to agree. You know, I, it's just like, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. I, I was only going to say that I have to believe that Chris Paul and LeBron and, and players like them have set a precedent that the owners don't like. And and not just the owners, the uh, the quote unquote fans. I mean, uh, when when I when I read what had happened with Carl Crawford, the disrespect being done to him, you know, it it it, it was like it was like must. If you don't play for this team, that 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 this certain group of people should should have the right to uh, be just vile towards you, you know. And, and I said the same with with Albert Pujols. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. He he left. But but the other team made a better offer. You know, if uh, St. Louis wanted to keep him, they should have made him a term that he agreed to. But M1, not everybody knows who, who who's Albert Pujols and who's Carl Crawford. You may have already said who Carl Crawford is, but who are those two guys? Uh, as as Richard Lawrence said, uh, Albert Pujols is a is. I mean, was a uh, St. Louis Cardinals player, all around good player, over three hundred hitter, great stats, helped them win two World Series. Was the uh, World Series MVP, as a matter of fact. Um, what would you guess that uh, Mr. Pujols' racial classification is? Uh, do you think he uh, would be classified as black, or I mean, he's definitely not white. No, that, that is true. I, I think they. I, I. I've always got the sense in baseball, per se. Me, just in my opinion, that they will tolerate the Hispanics more than they do the blacks. That 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 may be, you know, but 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 the thing the thing is when. I said when players from Dominican Republic, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, you know, come here and play baseball, you know, they may not be classified as uh, African American, but the disrespect does come. And now I see Alvin Pujols as my brother. Right. Same way I see Ken Griffey as my brother. You know, whether he agrees to it, I don't know. You know, it's like it's like the Sammy Sosa issue. Right. I see him as my brother. He may not see himself as one, but that's that's okay with me. The fact is, it didn't need to be. Uh, Subjected to mistreatment, so when he signs to go to the Angels, that was the same team where the fans disrespect the Carl Crawford. By the way, you know you hear people saying, "Oh, all of a sudden it's like you'll never be another Stan Musial." Whoever said he wanted to be one. Family, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Chris, can I add something? 
you the, what you are yeah yeah you're the you're the marquee guest so please the, say. the man running the hornets uh i did i did find his name dell Demps, a black man from long beach california now you do the math on how david stern felt about him doing the move that would have put chris paul in a lakers, a lakers uniform <laughs> oh 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 i see your point Oh wow! Okay. Then I, I want to put his name out there. Dell Demp is a young black man, not even forty-five years old, running the New Orleans Hornets right now. The NBA section. D E M. Dell D E L L, like the computer, and his last name is Demp. D E M P S. And what is his title? He's a he's the executive of. The I'm looking for. Operation. I believe that that's his internal title. Uh, he's an NBA executive in the league office. They put him in position to run the Hornets while they were looking for an owner. I don't know the exact title they gave him while running the Hornets, though. I do know that he is the one that orchestrated all the trades that have been in the news the last couple of weeks. And who basically his decisions were the ones that were vetoed. So this young man is the one who, in the business sense, was vilified by by David Stern and, you know, this young, I mean, his professional resume is is is, is a brilliant, and so you, you know, I wonder how this man feels. Let me ask you a business question about this whole Hornets thing that's confusing to me. Let's can we go back to that? We have a an, an organization. I don't understand the organization of it. We had a a team, an organization that went bankrupt, and I don't know if that was a Chapter Seven or Chapter Thirteen. Chapter 7 means I can't pay any of my bills. Please don't hold me responsible. Chapter 13 says if I reorganize and you somebody comes in and takes over and sets out a payment schedule as who gets to pay uh who gets paid when, um I can keep operating. Can you do that for me so I can keep my business open? Now I don't know whether or not the uh New Orleans Hornets is it? Uh, were a Chapter 7 or Chapter 13. But that having been said, I still don't understand what allowed them then to be owned by the NBA. And I don't know what that means because I had heard that it meant in one news story that every owner then was one twenty. There were 29 other owners because there are 30 teams in all, at all. That right. every owner had one twenty ninth share in that particular team, and I guess that's curious to me. Is that somewhere in the in in the bylaws? And then the other thing I didn't get is, wait a minute, when a business goes bankrupt, don't they just go out of business? Why couldn't there have just and and all of the employees lose their jobs? That's I mean that's that, we hear that all the time. The company went under, and the employees lose their jobs. Why didn't that happen? Why did they stay in business? then owned in this sort of really weird kind of vague way by the NBA. And then they and then I heard, this is a, I'm trying to put it all here at one time so you don't have to hear this female voice going on and on. Uh, and, and then, okay, well, so now, one, is it Dave, if 129th of them gets to own it, why is David Stern stepping in and making decisions? Oh, because he's their employee. Okay, so forget about that last question. But if you can just help me understand why it was that they didn't just go out of business and all those players lose their jobs and struggle for a place on some other person's team in the NBA or in Europe, that would be helpful. I, I, I guess I just – and was it a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 13 bankruptcy? Um, um, I don't – to answer that question, I don't really think it matters. In professional sports, now, what you're saying is, is absolutely right. In professional sports, that never happens. But the L.A. Dodgers are currently in bankruptcy as we speak, um, looking for an owner also owned by Major League Baseball. Um, it's a very common situation in professional sports, actually. Usually what happens is the owner gets divorced. <laughs> That's usually when these situations come. When an owner gets divorced and his wife starts suing, for half of his assets, usually the team gets sold off to pay the ex-wife. Wow. That's the exact case in the L.A. Dodgers situation. That, uh, that, that owner in particular was stealing money from the team's operating fund to pay for his court costs. Um, okay, in the Hornet it. situation, I'm not sure because they have recently moved. They had, for the longest time, been the Charlotte Hornets, 
and their move to ever since their move to New Orleans. Um, and actually, this is a bigger deal um, than just Chris Paul. The New Orleans Hornets should not be the New Orleans Hornets. They should probably be the Oklahoma City Hornets. When Katrina hit New Orleans, that team played basketball that year in Oklahoma City um, to sell out crowds. Then they moved back to New Orleans because the NBA felt like it would be in bad taste to take the Hornets from the city of New Orleans right after that hurricane. What they did end up doing was taking the Seattle Supersonics from Seattle and moving them to Oklahoma City and turning them into the Oklahoma City Thunder that are now currently in the NBA. Uh, Seattle is actually still campaigning the NBA for a new team, which will probably end up being these New Orleans Hornets that are about to get sold. Uh, that just uh, that I know that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> that just, this is all David Stern's organization orchestration. He believed that oh my God, we're not going to take New Orleans from uh, you know the Hornets from New Orleans. Two years, I think two or three years after they had moved there, um, they played in Oklahoma City, and the New Orleans Hornets owners at that time suggested to David Stern, "We believe we should just move the team here. It's a better market. The fans." are more willing to come to games. We believe we could operate better here. David Stern said no. And then took another team from a market that had thrived in basketball. The Seattle Supersonics were one of the most popular teams in the NBA and still are one of the most popular teams in the NBA, even though they don't exist. And he moved them to Oklahoma City. Now the Hornets need an owner and are basically not far from being bankrupt as a team themselves. And one of the ways they were looking to, that's been floated around, that they're looking to generate revenue is by moving them to Seattle. So we're essentially taking teams and switching them through cities because of bad decisions David Stern has made. He's made a lot of bad decisions in the past couple of years. Now, I said I was going to let the female voice back out, but I'm sorry. I hope this will be my last question, but it probably won't be, but I'm going to back out for a while. Um it, it almost seems like there's this deliberate sabotage to make the NBA this totally disorganized enterprise so that it will dissolve and that all of these players that are, you know, what is his name, Paul Gasol and all of these European players can return to their country of origin and then basketball will move overseas what? where... For sure, it'll be run by white people. I'm interested in hearing what the other brothers have to say, but I will just add this. For years, there has been talk that the NBA wants to create a European division. Hmm. Well, oh, sorry. I, you know, I wonder whether or not, as you said, these moves are these moves make no sense from a business or from a professional sports standpoint. Um, but the NBA has for years said we would like to have a European division. Players have always said we have no interest in having a European division. Yeah, it's interesting to see how that kind of situation would play out and what plays out from it. Hmm. That that doesn't surprise me because uh, I remember a few years ago there was this Sports Illustrated issue and it asked me what I thought was the ridiculous question. You remember the sports illustration said what happens to where's the white athlete or what's happening to the white athlete? <laughs> I remember that article well. Yeah, and I had noticed at that time you were starting to see an increase in uh European players. European players. players. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that article well, very well. So, 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 as you said, you're right. It was a, uh, it was starting then, and it wasn't just, uh, and it wasn't just that. I, I was noticing that our numbers were going down, and not just NBA, but Major League Baseball. Uh-huh. Even though, and I stated before, a lot of the players from Venezuela, Cuba, right. Dominican Republic are our brothers. 
they're not classified as our brothers, so they can be used against us. Right. So the fact that they're trying to go through a uh, NBA, you know, European League didn't surprise me. You know, had Yao Ming been more successful, there would have been a larger influx of players from China. From China, I believe so. so. They try when they tried anyway. <laughs> yeah. There's another Chinese fellow, I forget his name. He was even worse than Yao Ming. Talking about uh uh Yi. Um Yi. Yeah, the power board that plays for the wizards. Yeah. You <laughs> if you wanna call if you wanna call that plan. <laughs> exactly. Has anybody noticed? Has anybody noticed? Has anybody else noticed that the average skin tone of the basketball players has gotten incredibly lighter in the last fifteen, twenty years? Yeah, that that is true. You know, it's interesting. I was, I thought about that also. You know, going. <laughs> I, I know we talked about this. Uh, like. Like, I remember when the players that are called biracial look like Spud Webb right. or Jason Williams of the New York Nets, not the white Jason Williams. Mm, and now they're Blake Griffin. Jason yeah, looks look, look just like a ginger kid. And Chris Humphreys. Chris Humphreys, right. It's it's also as you bring that up, it's also uh very telling to me that Steph Curry, while being mixed, looks black and doesn't get the publicity of a lot of the players you just named. Mm. Exactly. Mm. 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 Um, sorry. I mean, I just found that that because that used to be. The thing basketball used to be a black guy's thing. I mean, that's where you saw the black men. That's where you saw the chocolate, you know, as some of us like to say, the chocolate delights. And uh, and and now I don't know what I'm looking at. I mean, even like, hey, I definitely consider Derek Fisher to be a black male, no question about it. He's black, no question. But he seems to be kind of almost the average skin tone now of a of a, a professional basketball player. And yeah. For most of my existence, he was definitely considered quite light skinned, but he's almost getting to be on the darker side. What the heck is going on? <laughs> That's true. Uh, that that could be an attempt of uh, you know trying to make the game, as they say, more accessible. <laughs> oh, definitely. I think um, a lot of the so-called white fans. Uh, have been disenchanted uh, and angry at the NBA for, for it's quite the Alan Iverson time. effect. It's the Allen Iverson effect. They're so mad for they're so mad at him. Allen Iverson was as popular as he was. Mm-hmm. And even Allen Iverson, I mean, I I wouldn't say he's a. I mean, he's he's medium brown skin black male, but right, he was, <laughs> he was the face of the game. But you know, it went from Julius Irving and Michael Jordan. To Allen Iverson, right. I mean, so even even there, it seemed the skin radiation got lighter um, uh, as the and '90s went on to the 2000s. And, and, you know, honestly, and I will say this, and I, cause I agree with you, I don't even, I don't know if, there, if it's the skin color has gotten whiter or their focus has gotten whiter because Kevin Garnett doesn't get that kind of publicity, but he also happens to be a very dark skinned man. He, he wins the championships. He makes the money. He, he was the number one draft pick when he came out of high school. But Kevin Garnett really never had the endorsements that a uh, Allen Iverson had or that a uh, Jason Kidd had. Although he it was seems, the same caliber of player. It seems like it's both to me. Not that I watch a lot of television. I can't because I don't have one. But uh, I did watch the finals. Um, was it last year, which was the Heat and the Mavericks? Because I it was very because of the politics of the thing, the whole runaway slave racial thing. Theater. That, the racial theater. I was in right. the whole uh, symbolic racial theater. I wanted those guys to prevail. Uh, so I watched that, and then.
then the previous year was the Lakers versus Boston, I believe it was. And um, and that I, rem I remember following that because I think that year Boston had a black head coach. I'm not sure who that was. And um, so I was I was for Boston for that reason. And, you know, once in a while I might have been around when my nephews were watching basketball and I would look out at that court. And it, well, I don't think it's just about the focus, Mr. Lawrence, because I would just look at the court and I would have a hard time many t picking out um, who was black and who wasn't. There were only, out oh, of, no, say, the I, ten, yeah, out of the ten players running up and down the court, I could only pick out two that I didn't have to have a close-up on to, to know what their racial classification was. And well, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I don't even mean, I think you have to go back to the article that, uh, you know, that was referenced, uh, you know, where are white people in sports. That has been, for the last almost 10 years, ever since Sports Illustrated ran that article, that has been a huge discussion, and I don't, I think that influences the minds of scouts of, of uh, you know, brothers ain't stopped playing basketball, but whether or not, and I just know that from my own personal experiences, yo, you're, you being recruited or you being seen per se has a lot to do with you ending up in that league. And I don't even know if they're, maybe they're not even going to look at the brothers they used to look at. Because they're definitely still out there playing basketball. They have, you go look at a college game, and I see a whole bunch of dark skinned brothers on the court. I see. Mm -hmm. And they're not, making, so much they're not making it to that level, that next level. And I'm wondering, is it because they're good enough or because they're being told they're not good enough because they're dark? Not because they're yeah. dark, but that's the real reason they're being, you know, that's the real reason they're being told they're not good enough or they're not getting drafted or they're not. They, they're still trying. And now I'm wondering whether or not the scouts aren't just going out there to look for a certain kind of look for the league, and especially in the NBA. And I, I really do believe that, you know, Michael Jordan was a dark skin, Kevin Garnett's dark skin. These are some of the best players in the league. But like I said, Kevin Garnett never got that level of endorsements that I felt he should have. He never had, you know, drug problems or he's married to a black woman. He's, but he never got those endorsements that players of his caliber get in other sports. And I wonder, I never had to wonder why. I figured I always knew why. But it's very telling to me because as he, as he brought that point out, you look at the NBA now, you you can't see football players, they wear helmets. But you look at the NBA now, and, yeah, the brothers are definitely a lot lighter than they were 10, 15 years ago. Wow. I don't think anybody can ignore that fact. I, I, I leave. There are whole mob. Just in what you, even in what you mentioned, Doc Rivers' son is, is in, uh, is probably will be in the NBA in another year. Um, mixed young man. And that's not any indictment on him or Doc Rivers. But I've seen him play basketball, and he is not <laughs> the—he is not as good a player as his recruiting status would suggest. Right. Uh, yeah, I definitely think it's a thing where uh, these scouts are probably trying to find white players, and they can't find white players. So they try to find the black players that the, are the least, I guess, threatening to the fan. Um, so, and, you know, I— I mean, I can run off a list of dozens of them. Uh, Mike Bibby, Delonte West, these right. are all people right. who are identifiably black. They say that they're black. Uh, Brooke Lopez, um, I believe he's black. Um, but all of these people who are identifiably black, but, you know, you can can't so, just say. Right. They can be sold to white people as palatable. And I, as you bring the point up, it, it sticks in my mind because it's not, I've never looked at it that way, but I definitely 100% agree. <laughs> it's you're right. Those I can't name that many players from my youth when I was eight, nine, ten years old watching basketball. I can't name that many Mike Bibbies. Right. Yeah, that is Brooklyn. that is true. Episode ID. This is the counter racist evolving engineer program Cree, and we're speaking uh, this evening with Richard Lawrence, a sports management professional, and we're also having a panel discussion with D Train, a host from the BTR program, Reckless 2.0. You can Google that or just go to BTR and find his program. And longtime listener and supporter, M1. If you would like to get in on this conversation, the number to dial is area code 347-633-9734. Again, 347-633-9734. Or if you are on the episode page and you have Skype, you can just click that Skype button, push the one, and I'll know that you want to join the conversation. There has been a listener who has had his or her hand up for quite some time at uh, last four digits, 8017. And if that is you, you are now on the air as well. 
Okay, hey, how you all doing? Uh, Great, how are you? How are you doing? I'm well. I would like to acknowledge the whole panel. Uh, Cree, we are friends on fa- excuse me, Facebook. But I wanted to comment on a discussion. Uh, while I don't disagree with much of what you all have stated, in particular, I believe Richard Lawrence stated that Kevin Garnett hasn't gotten many of the endorsements uh, as a lot of the other athletes. But if we recall, Kevin Garnett, I believe, was the first athlete to incur a $100 million contract while with the Minnesota Timberwolves. In the NBA, yes, he was. Yes, he was. Okay. I, I do well, want to thank you for bringing that up. Yes, sir. So I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to lose sight of, 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 of the nature of what we're talking about because I think that oftentimes we, as black people, whether we're dark or light, can perpetuate the divisions that have been placed upon us by well, white Hold on, I want, to stop, I want to stop you there because I see where you're going. Come on. Also, I want to stop because that you made a brilliant point. Kevin Arnett did, was the first NBA player, actually second. Shaquille O'Neal, uh, a couple of months before him with his original deal with the Lakers, got $135 million. Um, but Mr. Lawrence, Mr. Lawrence, Mr. Lawrence, Mr. Lawrence, Mr. Lawrence, Mr. Yeah. Lawrence can I take a host this privilege? Yeah. Uh, I, tr- I try, I try, I don't always succeed, but I try to allow people to finish their thoughts before oh, no, responding. I'm so sorry. No, no, it's okay. I mean, we, we, that's how we are as a people. We're very passionate, but I just want to make sure that everybody feels like they're getting, you know, heard. So um, yeah, if yeah. he could just finish this point first. Go, go ahead, sir. Okay, I appreciate that, Cree. So what, what I wanted to say is being under, you know, uh, you all have referenced a few uh, prominent people that I'm familiar with, in particular uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. I completely agree with a lot of her uh, concepts and ideologies. But, again, the fact of the matter is we are under uh, a white supremacist institution. I think the nature uh, at hand of what we're dealing with is we are not the only people, although we, have prob- we are probably mm-hmm. arguably the worst to, have to be subjugated and, and, and abused and, you know, uh, with chattel slavery, etc. I get that. But there is no group of people on this planet outside of the European uh, uh, that have been done as worse as all manner of peoples of color. So I don't think, I think that's something that we should not lose sight of and that we should take into consideration. Also, when it comes to Spanish colonization or colonialism, these just so happen to be your South American nations, with the exception of Brazil. Brazil, of course, was colonized by the Portuguese. And then you have, you know, uh, Central America, you have the parts of the Caribbean. So these are our brothers and sisters, I believe, as M1 alluded to. They're our brothers and sisters as well. Whether, whether or not they want to accept it, that's not my problem. But there's no distinct difference, as far as I'm concerned, between Alfonso Soriano or Sammy Sosa versus, say, an Albert Pujols, when all three of them are Dominican. So as far as I'm concerned, we, you know, as, as some former Vietnam vets will say, when they fought in the Vietnam War, many of the Vietnamese soldiers would say, we same because they just so happen to be darker, complected, Asiatic peoples. So, you know, I don't want to lose sight of the big picture because we are perpetuating the division. And what happens is we'll say we're minorities. They say we're minorities. We say we won't, but yet we say we are by saying dark versus light, etc. And we segregate ourselves. There's more people of color on this planet than any, than any European particular group. They, they are, in fact, the true minorities. But if we buy into these concepts of privilege that they give to uh, lights versus darks, etc., and at the end of the day they they classify us all as that proverbial N word, I think that we are our own biggest obstacles, and that's the, the conclusion of my thought. And thank thank you, Cree, for allowing allowing me the time and space to express my thoughts clearly. I appreciate you phoning in, sir. And right. uh, I'll just I'll leave your mic open, but if you could mute it in that way when you want to just pipe back in, you can without any sort of background. Appreciate you calling in. I would have liked to have known what to have called you, sir, if you could have given me a handle. What you say? What now? I would have liked to have uh, gotten a handle from you so I could know how to refer to you. Uh, I'm Joseph. Joseph Jackson oh. on Facebook. Joseph. <laughs> ah, I, I remember you, sir. Okay. Indeed. Well, thank you for we, thank you for thank you for your comments. You got it. You all yes. take care. You too, sir. All right now. Gentlemen, would you like, would you like to respond to that? Um, I only thing I would have like to, like to say, Mr. Jackson, kind of, I, I agree with it. Um, I, I definitely don't want to appear because me personally, I agree with everything he said in that aspect of 
regardless of our differences in, like the first brother said, I look at Sammy Sosa as my brother too. Um, now, whether he sees me as his brother, that's a different conversation, but that's not anything I can control. Um, now, when I speak about our differences in shade, I look at them, I am speak of them from the perspective of a white person, what's easier for them to quote-unquote accept. And what I was going to say about Kevin Garnett is it's almost – Funny in one sense, his contract led to the first lockout in 1997 the NBA had. When he got that $100 million contract, his $100 million contract is the reason why no current NBA player can make more than $80 million over the lifetime of their contract. About a $40 million decrease from what Kevin Garnett is still being paid. His contract ends this year, I believe, or next year. Um, so, you know, I've always wondered is part of the backlash for him being paid about $50 million more than any other NBA player that he only got the contract with Adidas in per se, where you look at Allen Iverson, who regardless of the times he was quote unquote arrested or in trouble, had Reebok deals, had TV endorsements, had, you know, various endorsement levels. As another brother pointed out, he's also a quote unquote fair skinned brother. And as I just, uh, you know, as it, it didn't, like I said, it didn't break my mind. So the first brother had said it. As I look at it just from a child's aspect, when I was, I'm, was born in 1983, so I grew up watching basketball in the early 90s, watching the Bulls, the Pistons, and teams like that. You did not. And how it's changed, I can only guess. And I believe, like the brother said, um, you know, maybe they're looking. That's, I, I believe that Sports Illustrated article was prophetic in that it put in the minds of business people, the, the, the scouts, the, the trainers, the coaches. Okay. We're going to go out and look for that that black man who we can sell to white men and to white women. And I believe it started a trend because I, and that's not to – say anything bad about the brothers in the NBA now, but I believe it has started a trend. And my only reason for saying that is because what about all the other brothers who don't look like them? Are they right. getting the fair shot that they should be getting? That's my only question. Right. It, we try to use the word just instead of fair here just because of the <laughs> just because of the the well, uh, way that you yeah. put the quotes around fair yourself. Um but yeah, I just uh I think you're right. I I I had wondered and and you made it clearer for me. I'm not sure who has that that background noise, but if you can mute your line when you're not talking, that would be that would be great. I know we can't always control what's going on in our household. Um it I had really was a, a two-part question, which was are are the people who are classified as black in this part of the world called the United States getting that much lighter skin has that much uh, genetic mixing gone on to where it's actually showing up on the basketball court and or is there some other sort of selective criteria going on like what goes on in the general labor market where lighter skinned people, males in particular are favored uh, have better employment prospects it's been demonstrated conclusively by William Darity and Derek Hamilton in their landmark study uh, is it just a labor market selection uh advantage under white supremacy to have lighter skin. And I think what I hear you saying, just based upon your experience, Mr. Lawrence, is that it's more of the latter than the former, that that there are darker skin, talented basketball players who are being discriminated against in that, uh, discriminated against, mistreated on, on the basis of darker skin shade in that labor pool. And that's truly, on my part, that's truly just a thought. I would very, be very interested to hear what everybody else, you know, has to say or would think about that. Oh no, I, I definitely agree with with with, with that because uh, as as you as you say, Cree, you know, not only was that study show this happening in sports. I mean, this is a uh, this is something that basically uh, covers all fields. I mean. Uh, I've read industries outside of sports where this type of uh, selective behavior is, is being done. And I hope I wasn't being negative on uh, 
by you know our lighter skinned brothers, I was I was just uh, making a point. But but if I was, I'll I'll have to uh, apologize. No, and I, I me, me as well because I I definitely you know don't want to appear like I'm trying to call it a, any kind of division. Like I said, I I truly when I make those kind of statements, I make them more so from where a white, where I believe a white person is looking at things, not so much a black person. Because my mother is extremely light skin is a light skinned woman. That's his life. I remember being a child, people looking at me and saying, "Is that your mama?" And that used to make me upset because why wouldn't that be? Um, mm-hmm. So I would never like to cause a division, you know, amongst anybody for or appear to. Um, but I, I do believe that you raise a good point. And I, like I said, I can only look through my just my own personal life experience and know that when I watched the NBA 15 years ago as a, as a child and collected basketball cards and stuff like that, no, the brothers on those cards were not as light as the brothers that are in the league today. And, right, and it's... And same you know, thing I here. I, an, I don't know what that's an exemplification of. Uh, like I said, that's why I'm interested in hearing everybody's thoughts because, but I know that it's happening. And you know, when the brother brought it up, I, all I could do is shake my head and say, "Wow, you know, that's a really good point." Well, it is entertainment, and just like skin color screens for who's going to be picked up as a star, as a singer, even now in in rap, um, it's gonna. It's going, to, it's going to screen in other forms of entertainment and just labor generally. And I guess for me, same thing. I'm looking at it from the perspective of the people exercising the power, and that is those people who practice racism and white supremacy, not so much from my perspective. Although I do have personal codes that I utilize in order not to perpetuate that caste hierarchy. Um, and I'm using $52 words. What I'm saying is I try in my own personal behavior not to do things that – promote the idea that the closer you can get to white, the better. But that doesn't mean that I don't recognize these people who are lighter skinned to also be victims of racism and white supremacy, albeit uh, less so than I. And I have a more com- complex analysis of the problem, which I don't think is now is the time to kind of uh, go, go into that, that kind of detail. Let me switch tracks a little bit and stay still on the um, issue of sports. Uh, pick one. And the first person that speaks uh, that speaks picks the topic. Uh, Barry oh, Bonds, sorry. Barry Bonds, Floyd Mayweather, John Jones. Okay, Barry Bonds. I'll go at I'll go at uh, Barry Bonds. Years ago, when the whole issue of steroids came up and players, baseball players using steroids. I stated that all of this talk was just a smoke screen to get at one person. <laughs> and that one person was was Barry Bonds. And when it was really clear to me was we all remember the moment it was announced that Jason Giambi was taking steroids. He's yeah. a uh, white baseball player. Played for the Oakland A's, then he came to the Yankees. Uh-huh. Okay, I I remember that day. I'll I'll never forget it. I was watching sports TV from day to night, and the top and the conversation would immediately focus to Barry Bonds. And I just thought, you know, he wasn't even implicated in anything, but yet everybody is focusing on him. And and I said, this is literally from watching sports TV from like 8 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. There was this uh, Fox Sports show that used to come on with John Sally, all those dudes. I don't know if you remember that show. Yes, I do. Yeah, uh, anyway. That, that sports show, yeah. 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 Yeah, and they too talked about, they too talked about, you know, Jason Giambi briefly. And then 
they announced the next guest. The next guest is Barry Bonds' former pro- former player. The San Francisco Giants who used to play baseball with Barry Bonds. And I said again, what does he have to do with this? <laughs> if the issue is Jason Jambi, why aren't you bringing on one of his former teammates? So I knew from there it was about him. And when they finally got him on on this whole quote unquote perjury. If you notice there was that whole then the whole uh Mitchell report came out on baseball and steroids. And it wrecked and and it recommended so much but no criminal prosecution for people involved in this activity. Yes, it did. And I just thought, that was it. They they had them. It's done. No one else. Palmiero lies before Congress. (laughs) No one goes after him. Even, Even when Major League Baseball sat on it just so they could make more money off him, Right. Sat on it. Roger Clemens was given a mistrial, right. and it's and it's doubted he's and it's doubted that the feds are going to retry him. Right. So I just said it was about him, and they got him. He's in house arrest, beats prison, but it's still too much. As we though. say, larger confinement, but still, it, it was all about him. Right, and that's what I said. I I can't. I don't have anything to add because everything you said covered it from my end. I I believe Barry Bonds is. It's just regardless of whether you think him using steroids is right or wrong, it is not a criminal offense in the sense that he should be under any kind of arrest, when, especially when nobody else is. If I'm not mistaken, now somebody correct me if I've, I'm incorrect, but the only person to have ever served hard time for using a performance-enhancing drug for athletic performance is not only a black person, but a black female, Marion Jones. Someone correct me if I'm incorrect. And to my recent knowledge, you would be correct. Wow. Of all the people to to send to prison to do hard time for enhancing performance in athletics, a black female. To me, that's akin to putting Serena Williams in prison, if by, you know, or Venus for finding out that she's been using performance enhancing drugs, while all of these white men and black males do it. You send you know, to actual prison a black female. And I didn't hear a bunch of uproar about that. I didn't hear a bunch of, oh, my, that's so unjust. I didn't hear that about her. And I'm just, I'm registering that and asking why not. No, I I, I, I agree with you. And and sad to say, you know, this is kind of the way we treat sisters. I believe her boyfriend went to jail, but I still believe she served more time. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. She did, she's, I think she's the lead. She's done the most time behind this whole steroid thing. And let's not forget the public humiliation. Yeah, she was humiliated. And she'll never recover from her public humiliation. Now that, yeah. And even if her boyfriend did do time, as far as marquee athletes, she's it. No, no, he was never in her popularity class, no. Mm-mm. And so it's like more of that's that, again, goes to why I put those pictures up as the sort of uh, symbol of this program is the coupling of the brown skin, black male, and black female, you know, the athletes. Because anything to just turn topsy turvy, uh, the relation between us. You know what I mean? It's like the black male is not allowed to be the manager 
and the black female is not allowed to be protected by her manager. And, uh, you know, if, if anybody should have gone to prison, it should have been a white male. But certainly, if a black person was going to go to prison, it should have been a black male. But this is just to show black people that we don't have, that black males are, will not be permitted to protect and provide, provide in the case of these three gentlemen in the NDA, for black females. And black females are not allowed to be protected and provided for. So as she begins planning, as Mr. Paul's wife begins planning for her move, uh, and her husband has probably has told her, baby, I got this, we're going to New York. And she's made all kinds of plans. Who knows? She may have made, I don't know how many trips out to L.A. to, um, to New York to get, a, to get an apartment or a house, what have you. She may have made deals, you know, made all kinds of plans for school, for her okay. offspring. And then he's got to come home and say, well, I, I, know, what I, I know what I told you, babe, but um, I, mean, I know, I, I know, I know I told you I had this. But uh, no, uh, no, um, n n no, he, what, that's not where we're going, baby. And this is what I mean about it. it's a public humiliation, but it's also a very private one. And it's one that um, ultimately, like, it works on the psyche, even if that's not your husband, it works on the psyche of all black males and all black females. And no, to, I believe it does. Yeah. Because I saw it. I, what you're saying is very telling. I saw an interview with Chris Paul this morning on Sports Center, and he seemed a lot more somber in his mood than I have ever seen him. He's normally a very cheerful, he's a very public uh, player. You know, he does a lot of charity events, and he, every year he does a bowling tournament that's broadcast on ESPN and stuff. So he's a very, uh, very lighthearted, cheerful guy from wherever I've seen him. And um, on his interview, he was very quiet, very somber. So he, I mean, he, everything you say, Probably it was a conversation he did have at home with his wife. And then to be sold to the very worst team, I mean, that just seemed like you were just, he, that David Stern was just, just stomping and, you know, twisting his toes on his neck. I mean, the very worst team, the losingest team. The reason that Chris Paul wanted to leave was to go to a winning team or a team that he had a chance of winning a championship. And you right. send him to the laughing stock of decades. I mean, talk about humiliation, nigga. You said you wanted to go to New York. No, I'll tell you what. You're not even. You're not only not going to New York. You're going to the entire to the entire other coast and to the worst team in the history of the NBA. How you like that, nigga? How you like that? I mean, and I truly believe. I truly believe that's the mentality behind the decision. Where it's going to backfire potentially from a basketball standpoint is David Stern's not a basketball man, he's a lawyer. And he traded Chris Paul to a team that potentially has the ability to win an NBA championship. Then that makes him like an even bigger idiot. And I don't think he, I, could, I think that the premise behind his decision was everything that you just said. Ha ha, nigga. You're going to the worst team in the league, not the team that you wanted to go to. Now, of course, David Stern could be the NBA equivalent of George Bush, which is destroy the entire organization and then bring in a black guy. When, when in in all likelihood, the enterprise um, is over now. Like I said, <laughs> uh, um, Demps was the man that runs the uh, uh, Hornets, and I want to mention another man. His name is Tadurma Ussery. Um, last name spelled U S S. E R Y, um, and there is a third man I could not find his name tonight. But to Dharma yesterday, um, Demps who runs the Hornets. These two are two of the three men who are have been floated and rumored to replace David Stern. So that question, that statement that you just posed, it's very can be very relevant, very poignant. Uh, what league could they be potentially taking over? And you know, and what standing will it be in? And then, if it's not in good standing, do they get the blame for the league taking a quote unquote step back? I'm sure they will. But you know, is it is that the plan per se? Because it's seeming like that's the plan. That's what it seems like to me. I'm not sure how we got back from Barry Bonds over to basketball again. I'm not sure how how that happened, but. Uh, and, but I will note that 
they got Barry Bonds as M1. M1 added so much information that I had never heard before. Yeah. Uh, and so there was that. And um, I, I, I want to thank I'm sorry, M1, when he mentioned Roger Clemens, Roger Clemens to me was the biggest telling piece of everything that he mentioned because, like he said, the feds haven't, they're probably not going to retry Roger Clemens. Why is Barry Bond sitting in house arrest? Wow. And and Roger Clemens' use of steroids was identical to Barry Bond's. It achieved the exact same effect in both of their playing careers. Both of them were Hall of Fame players before they ever pumped a bit of steroids into their body. They did it to prolong their careers. So why is only Barry Bonds prosecuted? And we all know why, but that and like you said, why only Mary why did only Marion Jones serve hard time for her use of steroids? Those are very I'm glad that you even mentioned them and that and one mentioned them. That those are very those in and of themselves probably deserve their own show. I hear you. I hear you, and, and uh, you're certainly in, you're certainly invited back. Before they got Barry Bond, I should probably do another program ID. This is the Counter Racist Evolving Engineer Program. We're speaking this evening with Richard Lawrence, who is a professional sports management uh, consultant, and he is speaking with us as well as panelist M1 and BTR host. D-Train, who we haven't heard from in a few minutes, uh, on the I issue of racism in sports and how it plays out, uh, starting with this uh, NBA thing. Um, tomorrow is going to be the tip-off, right, of the NBA, and we'll see this whole drama unfold, and we'll get to hear who gets booed and who gets applauded and so on. Uh, and it's always, you know, we always have to make, the black athletes always have to make, they have to, they have to make all kinds of excuses for why it is that uh, they don't get the applause and the celebration that they should and why they're being booed. They can't say because white people don't like me, because if they do that, if they tell the truth, anytime under the system of racism and white supremacy, if you bring truth to bear on the subject, you will get abused. It's like an abused child uh, telling, you know, grandma or hopefully it's a black social worker, my mommy hits me, um, you're going to get hit worse. So, But especially if you have a whole system of it, you don't, you don't tell. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, we, got, we kind of covered Barry Bonds. We didn't cover the fact that they made him wear a dress. I, I guess we could say they didn't make him, but uh, I don't think that he knew what he was doing. But when he put the I'm, dress I'm, I'm on... I'm sorry, I'm not even aware of that. Can you go, can you go into that, please? <laughs> you know, the guys can probably do it better than I can. D-Train, if you're on the line, can you talk about Barry Bonds' dress wearing? Uh, great. Can I be heard? I can hear you yeah. loud and clear. Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I I got disconnected from the line uh, a while ago, and I, I didn't know if I if I had uh, been uh, I guess unmuted back. Um, um, but um, the Barry Bonds in a dress. Yes. I missed that one. I'm. I'm I missed so, that one. I, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I've heard about that. I haven't looked much into it. I mean, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly when it happened, so I would be the, I wouldn't be the most reliable source uh, to retell. Um, but I do remember hearing about this, um, but I do not have uh, I do not have the I guess the exact details of what happened. Darn, I hadn't I hadn't even heard about it. Y'all y'all are putting me on to information that I will be going to look for as soon as I hang up this phone. Okay, I'm actually looking at it right now. That to me is that to me is just. It's supreme. For what reason? Barry Bonds dons a wig and dress in a Paula Abdul impersonation in Scottsdale, Arizona. This would have been in 2006. Yeah. He entertained and delighted a small gathering of fans and teammates Tuesday by dressing up as Abdul to judge the San Francisco Giants spinoff of the hit Fox show American Idol. Bonds, who wore a strapless dress and a blonde wig, surprised everyone watching the mock contest. Where I lied. I lied. I do remember that. I do, <laughs> I, I do remember that. I do remember that. Now that you read the article, I do remember that. Yes. Wow. Yeah, I remember seeing that, actually. <laughs> you remember? And that, I was think around, was, that was around the same time he was being essentially persecuted for, because he was already suspected of being using steroids. He was going at the Babe Ruth record. That was around the time he was trying to, quote, unquote, appease people to... It looked good while he was breaking this white man's record. Mm. 
very interesting. Right. Uh, right. Team, that was not, I, I fully believe that was nothing Barry Bonds conceived of doing in his own. <laughs> Barry Bonds. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't even remember. It, it literally took you reading the article for me to even see it in my head. And yes, that 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 struck me as weird then. But I have to look at the context. I have to think back to what the context of it was, and I remember the heat Barry Bonds was taking as he inched closer to being an all-time home run leader. And it was the only person who could probably identify with him was Hank Aaron himself, because um, they, they were they were coming at Barry Bonds from all angles. You know, he's a steroid user. He's a liar. He's a an adulterer. He's a stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with baseball. Um, he don't pay his child support. He don't. This was not true stuff. But they were bringing everything about his personal life. So I can only imagine somebody told him, oh. "You put this dress on, you'll make everybody like you." <laughs> I think another issue was that he was a bit more codified with the white reporters than other. Um, he was uh, baseball players were, um, and he had a reputation with. Uh, with the white media for not being as friendly uh, as some of the other, I guess, personalities, stars in baseball. So I think he also got a bad rap for that, that he that he really wasn't, you know, kissing you know, the media. I don't think it was ever that. I only, I, for years, I read a uh, sports article, Sports Illustrated article years ago, which supposedly, and who knows how true that was, it was supposedly talks about the night Barry Bonds decided he was going to even take steroids. And in his mind, as a player, he saw all the white players around him taking steroids. And he saw all these white players that he knew he was better than all of a sudden performing better than him. And he knew why. And he, yep, was, sitting I mean, talking, he was sitting there talking to Ken Griffey Jr. And he's like, you know, they're breaking our records. They, they, they're still in our place in history, and they ain't doing it on natural talent. If I take, and they immediately said in his mind went off. If I take steroids, I hit eighty home runs. Uh, which he did. <laughs> he was pretty close to it. Pretty pretty close to it. So right. I mean, I think I mean Barry Bonds, like you said, is, was a Hall of Fame player before he ever, you know, when he was a skinny dude that paid for the Pittsburgh Pirates. I mean, he was a forty forty dude even back then. Right. So he I mean, never needed a steroid. He never needed a steroid to perform at the highest level. I truly do believe, though, that he saw all them white players around him taking steroids and saying, "Hold up, this dude couldn't, this dude can't carry my bag to the to the ballpark." But he hitting fifty home runs. I think um, him seeing Brady Anderson and Mark McGuire uh, <laughs> over to white players. Brady that, Anderson, I was gonna, I was gonna say his name. I didn't know it was even relevant, but you you named him out. Brady Anderson was the perfect player. Brady Anderson hit fifty home runs one year. Ain't no way Brady Anderson ever had the talent to hit fifty home runs, and I'm sure that led to Barry Bonds' decision. <laughs> oh yeah, I definitely think that was one of the side factors. Um, and you know, just saying, I mean, I think even Mark McGuire was a player. You know, that was you know he was okay before he started juicing. Uh, white, those were the exact, players. and I laugh because those are the exact players Barry Bonds was supposedly talking about at that dinner with King Griffey Jr. The Mark McGuire, wow. Brady Anderson. Wow. He, he was saying to King Griffey Jr. Man, these dudes couldn't. These dudes came up in the minor leagues with us. They didn't. They weren't on anybody's list. They weren't any on. They weren't making name and national news. Where are they coming from now? They coming. They using steroids. <laughs> and and did Ken Griffey Jr. and supposedly Ken Griffey Jr. told Barry Bonds, I, "I feel you, man, but I've already played eighteen years. What's the point?" But Barry Bonds was seeing. He was seeing his legacy being assaulted. I mean, let, 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 as a baseball and just a pure sports fan, Barry Bonds. Like the men, like like M trained to say, Barry Bonds is a Hall of Famer before he ever was alleged to have ever done anything, and there were a lot of people who were mad at him about that way before the steroid accusations came about. He was always right. Like, I mean, always carrying a bad right. light in those white reporters' eyes, so it does not it's not lost on me that they were out to get him. And he's always alleged that they were out to get him. He looks right now. <laughs> well, definitely. I mean, he was already one of the most feared uh, batters in, in a major league baseball. I mean, <laughs> they, they, I mean, even before he, you know, allegedly started taking steroids, uh, which I, I think he's admitted now. Um, he, uh, he, uh, you know, pitchers would intentionally walk him. Um, I think he still had some of the highest on base percentages in, in baseball yeah. history, and 
I guess the other thing that you have to take into account is that steroids doesn't, I mean, doesn't account for the hand-eye coordination necessary no. to actually to actually hit the ball and to hit 40 home runs before you even started using uh, performance enhancing drugs. So, and I, and I truly, and then this, you know. I truly believe that as this as a man and a person who's played sports myself at any point in life, Barry Bonds could that competitive spirit that comes inside an athlete could not allow him to watch people he knew were not physically as gifted or as talented as him perform better than him when he knew they shouldn't be. And he went out to play with to, to even the playing field. Everybody in baseball was using steroids five or six years ago. They can baseball can say they didn't know that, but nobody believes that. <laughs> Program ID is the Counter Racist Evolving Engineer Program. And in about four minutes, we're going to stop the live streaming. So if you want to be able to listen to the program in the minutes that remain or up to 60 minutes that remain after the first two hours, uh, you'll need to call the switchboard at 347 633 That's 347 633 And like I said, you have just under four minutes to do that. Um, on this issue of doping, first I'll state my opinion. Um, I don't know if I want to call it doping. I'm going to call it performance-enhancing drugs. I I don't think that what uh, Mr. Bonds did was incorrect. Uh, if everyone is speeding, uh, or if everyone is, I mean, you, everyone should be having the same equipment. The same playing field. The same playing field. And uh, if we're going to be, if they're going to be cheating or using certain things and we're not, we're never going, I mean, obviously this is just sports, but I'm really thinking about it on a larger scale, which is that this idea that we have to be the long-suffering ones who play by the rules they set while they go outside those rules, I think we better start changing how we think about things. You know, talking to you, talk, from talking to you, Pri, I can only say that I've drawn the conclusion Barry Bonds is only sitting in jail because he chose not to play by their rules. <laughs> by the rules they set for him. Especially by the rules him. they set for him. He said, I'm not playing. And for his entire career, Barry Bonds has said, I'm not playing by you, your rules because Willie Mays is my godfather and Bobby Bonds is my daddy. And I come from a baseball legacy. I don't need to play by our rules. I, my family was rich before I ever hit Major League Baseball. I don't need baseball money. I don't need – Barry Bonds has always had that attitude, and for good reason. And I think that's the attitude to which D-Train was alluding when he said that he behaved in a more codified way, which is that he wasn't, you know, especially um, – what, what, what is the word? He wasn't inappropriately – ingratiating. He didn't smile no. when there was nothing funny. You know what no. I mean? He didn't he wasn't self deprecating. Never. Was, uh, that's right, that's why the dress thing I that's why I forgot about the dress thing because he was never everything that you're saying he never was. Right. They couldn't take and, it. And they couldn't take that from him and I believe that's why he's sitting cause why is he even being prosecuted for something, regardless of whether he did, didn't, he admitted it, fine, that's all well and good. He hasn't played baseball in four or five years. <laughs> why is this uh, important? His choice is in, in the mate. The mother of his children, is she is she black? Uh, no, she she's white and appropriately named Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you'd have said glow, I would have agreed with you. But uh, sunny, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem like she's equipped for the sun. I will, I will give Barry his credit on one thing. He let that go years ago. Oh, he did. Okay, all right. Yeah, that, um, that, that is true. But yeah, and then he did marry a black woman. But but again, you you know what also got this uh. This whole thing started. His white mistress diming him out mm -hmm. to, the, to the cops. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure if anybody else remembered that. You are exactly right. Yes, you are. Yeah. This, is, this is how the whole thing got started. His mistress, white mistress, fell him out. She she phoned the police and said that he perjured her, himself, or what did she do exactly? No, it, it, it's... <laughs> 
she, I believe she was the first one to say that she saw syringes and stuff and then believe that he was taking steroids. And then from that came all the investigations that pretty much took down, not even just him, but a whole lot of people by default, you know, indirectly. But she was, it was her. <laughs> yeah. And, and the truth is, she, she really did that because she thought as his mistress, she deserved more money than he was more giving money. her. Right. right. And he said no, so <laughs> she dimed him out. I, I well, can now, honestly say that as a sports person, I've always respected in the way that Barry Bonds, like you said, he didn't smile when it wasn't appropriate. He didn't make the you know make the the typical kind of yes sir comments when they weren't. There was no reason for that kind of stuff, and I believe that you know after a while they just couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think he was kind of the. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you go. I was going to say he was kind of the anti Griffey, um, and I, I'm black King Griffey victim, uh, blackmail, um, and you know I'm a King Griffey fan, but uh, King Griffey was always known uh, for being, you know, quite pleasant to uh, right, right. to the media. Or Frank time. Thomas. Oh yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, he, he was always smiling. <laughs> But, but like I, I mean, and like I, I said, Barry Bonds. Why would he feel like he had to do that? He, you know, Willie Mays is my godfather. Bobby Bonds is my daddy. I, I can play this game, and I don't owe y'all nothing. And, and he came with that kind of. And I, I, and I've always felt like, even as a child, they don't like Barry Bonds. <laughs> Barry Bonds is a little bit too strong of a brother for them, for them, for that old boys club in baseball. But you know, I don't think that he understood what you just said. Mr. Lawrence, because if he did, and again, this is totally not me blaming him at all. This is why we keep repeating, those of us who do repeat it, that if you don't understand racism, white supremacy, everything else that you do understand will only confuse you. And many times when I repeat that, I'll have two calls immediately dropped from my line. It's immediately, it's like, oh, God, not, this, not the quote-unquote race card again. But the reason we do that is because we are so, so sad Every time something like that, meaning the footage that got taken of Mr. Bonds putting on the dress because he thought that would take the heat off, if he had better understood the system, how it seeks to undermine our sexuality, that that's the greatest thing it seeks to do, to make us into things, to undermine wow. our sexuality, uh, that that is the reason they couldn't take him behaving as close to a man as he is possible under the system, then he would have known not to put on that dress, but he didn't understand. He didn't understand. He thought, like you said, my godfather is a Hall of Famer, a legend. My father, the same thing. I don't need this money. I don't need your adulation. I come from baseball royalty, so I don't need to. And so, but he, and that's the reason he didn't feel like he needed to do that. However, if he had understood what was going to come because of that and why... I he wouldn't have put on that dress. And I know it's it's going to be something that's going to haunt him for the rest of his life because his children are going to so. see that. I believe so, too, because everything about him and the image he gave off countered that one thing. It goes completely opposite to that. Right. And, you know, I, I, can, I 100% agree. Um, he just, I believe he did not understand what he was doing because um, it makes no sense. He was too to me. In my, he always appeared to me as to be too strong of a person that'd be doing a uh, a stunt like that. Right, and again, he's a victim just like me, and I don't always understand the things I'm doing, and so you know, I right. I suppose things that I've done could come back to haunt me. But I would ask this question too: Do you think that uh, Floyd Mayweather understands why he is treated the way that he's treated? No. Talk to me. Um, just from his general conduct, uh, just kind of the, I guess, in the buffoonish way he acts, um, yeah, I, I seriously don't think that uh, Floyd understands. Um, I, I have to agree. Yeah. 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 But you say that he, beha he behaves in a buffoonish way. Now, it... If if he was that much of a buffoon, why do white people hate him so much? 
he's I, I, I kind of want to take that one. He uh, uh, sometimes I don't know. For some other kind of confuses me as why I'm, it's, it's, I struggle to get the words out. He, obviously, he's brilliant. He's done things in boxing financially that nobody else has ever done. Um, the the paydays that he gets for the fights that he takes, and the amount of control he has over the promotion of his fights is is, is revolutionary in boxing. Um, which makes his like like the first brother would say some of his, and I I have to agree some of his buffoonish acts more perplexing to me. Um, so I I, I can't really put an answer to it. I think, but I do think they hate him because he operates in. I think he he's operates in a black owned business. That I do know. Team Mayweather is is pretty much a hundred percent black, um, and family. And um, so what he you know the money that he makes he keeps in his family. And I think that in and of itself is a reason for a lot of the the hate directed towards him. He doesn't bring in the outsiders. And boxing is notorious for the the, the black man with the white manager. Mm. Who's taking who's taking sixty percent of his earnings? You know. I think um Muhammad Ali had that. I don't mean to cut that but I just wanted to say that. I think maybe buffoon may have been the, the wrong choice of words. Um I, I do believe that uh that the big weather is a very intelligent individual. And I do think um but I don't think he's as I guess codified, um per se as yeah. um as you would um, want him to be, and I think... I think that's a better word. I, I just want to say, I do. I think that's a better word. I have to agree. Yeah, um, and, and he, he's really show off Um And, you know, he talks a lot of trash, and, you know, those are th- things that white people typically um, don't like. Um, and those are the kind of things that... Um, I guess I, I'm trying to see how I can put this... Um, Oh, typically his comments. Um, um, oh, for example, like his comments about Manny Pacquiao. Um, I think this was uh, maybe a year and a half ago uh, when, when the whole thing was coming up about uh, these two attempting to set up a fight date. And he made the comments about Manny Pacquiao. With, uh, do, does anybody remember those comments that he made about chopping them up, like, <laughs> frying them like cats and dogs or something yeah, like that. Yeah, okay, yeah, I remember those. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just kind of those comments. Um, <laughs> and I'm not saying that's why white people hate them. I don't, I don't think that at all. I just think that, um, I don't think that he understands completely, um, you know, the system that he's facing, um, going out and making disparaging comments, um, about other people um, that I would say, or I think that white people would say are not white. Um, I, I just don't think that he fully understands. And I, I do think that he has kind of a belligerent attitude uh, towards white, uh, from what I've seen. But uh, that's also not going to, uh, that's also not going to do to white people. So I think that, that may be the reason white people hate him. But, uh, in a lot yeah. of ways, I think about Floyd. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just really think he needs not would benefit. I, would, I guess would be a better word from a, a, a more. I'm not gonna say more knowledgeable. A, a brother with some. A brother with more diverse experiences and it, around him in his inner circle um, to help, like the like the brother said, uh, help school him in, in in how to codify himself better. Because um, I do believe he's a very intelligent man. Um, and I don't want to take that from him at all. I believe he's a very intelligent man. And I said the things he's doing financially for boxing in terms of a boxer controlling their own financial destiny, they're unprecedented. He's, he's, he's done things that nobody else has ever done that kind of get overlooked. Um, and I don't want to say because of his innings. I, I think they use his innings to make it get overlooked. Um, but... I just think he would benefit from a, a more knowledgeable, more worldly, you know, experienced um, brother or sister who who's seen and and been through some things that he hasn't um, to kind of talk him through. You know, maybe you want to think about 
before you say this or before you go out and do that. Well, he's certainly flamboyant. Uh, I will give you that. Uh, and that's not allowed. And the word that black people, I'm sorry, the word that white people use to describe black males who show a lot of um, skill in uh, athletic pursuits that they're not allowed to have, and this is, I think, a very telling word. Because if you go on YouTube, this is the word you'll see a lot. You guys all know it, right, what I'm about to say. In fact, let me see if anybody can guess what what, what word they use instead of flamboyant. Does it begin think, with you? Think, no, think well, Zing. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're getting close. Dun, 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 The word is cocky. Oh, yeah. 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 I thought uppity, but cocky is the wrong word. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Cocky is definitely the word. Because black black. Black male athletes are not allowed to be cocky under any circumstances. Yeah, yeah you're right about that. <laughs> yeah, right about Dr. Weldon's fingerprints all over that one. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, and he certainly, he is certainly that. And, you know, I noticed that um, my husband's a big UFC uh, uh, fan. In fact, he's off to go see... Um, New guy Overeem fight some white guy tonight, and uh, and so because he's such a big fan of it, you know, I've had to watch untold hours of it or at least observe it, and uh, and I've noticed that UFC has kind of a it's real, but it has kind of a WWF feel to it, and yeah. that the whole idea of it is to be cocky, you know. So when the white guys win, they're ah! you know they jump up on the cage and they're. Ah! If a black guy does anything like that, he is just roundhousely booed. And so it's like these guys win fights like uh, the black guy, Anderson Silva, um, John Jones. After they win, they literally, and it's totally unnatural for testosterone because testosterone is an animating chemical. It makes you assertive and aggressive. It's totally unnatural to have that force running through you and then as soon as you've done this and just hammered this other guy into the ground to go onto your knees in a prayer-like meek stance. You know, but that's what they have to do in order to just be tolerated and not kick out of you know, the ring. John Jones, which again, I know all this stuff because, you know, if I'm going to spend time with him, I've got to do some of the stuff he wants to do. So I have to, you know, uh, do this stuff. And uh, so for me, look at the you know the racial politics of it and um john jones actually has this white girlfriend with whom he has two offspring he hasn't married her for whatever reason and he has a tattoo across his chest it's a bible quotation and he tries to be the meekest you know most un uh, threatening but he doesn't but the problem is he doesn't smile enough he doesn't laugh enough he's not silly enough and so even though he goes to his knees and he's me, can he talks about white Jesus all the time? Uh, they boo him, and when he when when he's asked, well, why do people boo you? You know, he can't ever say, oh, it's because I'm black. He always has to say, oh, well, it doesn't matter as long as they're reacting to me at all. You know, um, but it's back on this this boxing issue. See, this is where I think it becomes more complex because I, I guess I would start with this. I needed to ask. You, D Train, and you, Mr. Lawrence, what each of you means when you say codified? Because you've said that Floyd Mayweather is not as codified as you would want him to be. What do you mean when you say that? Well, I guess my response would be um, that I don't think he's using, well, I'm not going to say what's correct or incorrect, but I don't think that he's using uh, the most, I guess, uh, think terms or um, when he's out talking, I don't think he's using, I guess, the most accurate terms or to define things or to, to get his point across. I think, you know, white people just kind of see it as, and, and I kind of see it as, just kind of chest thumping. Um, and I guess that's what I would say is, you know, for him to take it down a notch, <laughs> realize, you know, we're in the system, you know, and um, to act accordingly. Um, 
and that's not to say that he shouldn't be, I guess, proud of his accomplishments, because I, I think he's accomplished a great deal. I just think that um, part of he's your portraying... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it was me. I, I'm sorry. It, it looked like I dropped. Please go on. Oh, um... I don't know. I just, <laughs> I just think of the loud, boastful person on the plantation when I when I see Floyd, and I'm just like, um, well, we're still on the plantation. I see. Um, okay. And my only thing I would like to add to that is, um, uh, you know, I, if he, um, if he is, um, aware of the complete you know, kind of scrutiny that comes to him being who he is, um, given what he may do or may not do, then I believe that's one thing. Um, I just want him to be aware of, uh, just for, like, for instance, with his situation, he, he cannot be as boisterous as he is and then make that mistake, which gives him 90 days in jail. Um, that will only be used to attack him. So if he's going to be who he is and be that boisterous person, if that's who he truly is, I'm not going to say play change. But he needs to be aware that him being that person needs needs to hold him to an even higher standard. And though that may not be fair, that is the world we live in, he needs to realize I'm not going to make a mistake that that's going to make it that much easier because they're going to attempt to bring me down anyway. They're never going to really see me as an equal, so I need to watch my steps, and that's all I really want him. I don't want to read my paper, pick up my paper one day and see Flay Mayweather in this drama or that drama or he got 18 months for slapping some woman or something like that. I don't want to see that with him, with a brother who's doing so well in so many other areas of life, so I just want to make sure that he, you know, knows it from my personal opinion that he has made it in a sense. But that's like the other man said, we're still on the plantation, and you have to watch this step, um, or they'll take everything from you. Michael Vick, okay. an example. So that if I could uh, just uh, kind of rephrase it so that I understand it, and if you can tell me if I'm understanding what you're saying, um, each of you, I, and it seems like you, you're saying similar if not the same thing, which is that you don't think that he says and does the most he doesn't try he doesn't understand the importance of saying and doing the most correct thing that he can do under conditions dominated by racism white supremacy as a victim of that system would that would that be a correct restatement that's 100% correct yes okay. and i don't only say that i believe that if he wants to walk outside of that quote unquote system that's fine i just personally would like to see him hold himself to a standard where he cannot be a, a readily, atta easily attacked because I don't want to see the brother fail at, at what he does. I really, I believe that he is a, a successful brother, and I love to see us succeed in whatever we choose to do, and I would just hate to, they always seem to bring us down with our failures and things that have nothing to do with the area that we succeeded in. And I would never, I would hate to see that happen to him. Well, they do say they being that I said, I'll just say I said, uh, I say, as you say, uh, relating to what you're saying about bringing bringing us down in other areas. Well, I, I agree that this, the system of racism, which is white supremacy, operates in all areas of people activity, which can be divided into uh, nine broad areas of uh, economics, education, entertainment labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, and it looks like they got Floyd on that eighth area, sex, on the last one. That's a pretty common one. It looks like they got, uh, in my opinion, they got Kobe on that eighth area one as well. Um, Definitely. Uh, <laughs> I, I got an email from... Uh, from uh, I, I'm not sure she wants me to say who she is, but she's the one who made me aware of the term underground gold digger. And I posted it to my Facebook, and uh, the de definition that I got from this person who sent it to me was that it is a, a white 
slash bright skinned female who scopes out for affluent black athletes precisely to fleece them of everything they have financially and and belongs to a team of wives who work together for that purpose. Uh, and I, I would, you know, I don't know if that applies to Mr. Bryant's soon-to-be ex-wife, it appears to be, but it does bring up the issue of the color caste system. And if there is a color caste system, I'm, I don't know that you and I, I mean, you know, you know, D train, I have a lot of admiration and respect for what you say and think, and I'm not at all 100% co- uh, convinced that my, my analysis is correct. It's the one I hold for now, but I, I, I mean, but we do. I think there is a caste system. It isn't as simple as uh, black or white. It isn't as simple as um, white or non-white. It depends on the moment. And and I thought that you know. <clears throat> I'm going to tell a little bit of a story, even though I'm not the featured guest here. I'm going to tell a little bit of a story just to get back to this whole Floyd Mayweather uh, comment about Manny Pacquiao and eventually related to this issue of uh, the last fight he had with Ortiz and that whole supposed controversy, which there was none except the one made up by the racists, as far as I could see. Uh, A a while ago, I'm not going to say how long ago it was, but it was more than 10 years ago. Definitely more than ten. It was actually more than fifteen years ago. I was uh, I was at a a, a Pollo local right outside this the high school at which I was teaching at the time. I had gone out for some dinner because I had to go back to my classroom and do some work. And um, oh my goodness, I was I was in the drive-through and I saw this uh, a man who I'm sure described himself as Latino. I don't know if he was Mexican, but I think so. Standing at a bus stop. And all of a sudden, I saw these very definitely black kids run up behind him and apparently for no reason at all, pounced on his head. And I was just aghast at it. And I did it just, it apparently for no reason at all, and they were smiling and grinning. And this man's um, eyes started bleeding. That's how hard they hit him. His eyes, the blood was coming out of his eyes, was coming out of his ears. And I, he was maybe in his early 30s, and these kids were in their teens, it looked like, maybe at the most, their early 20s. And I drove around. I just got out of the drive through line because I, I was so uh, just aghast at what happened. And I drove up to him, and, and, and uh, when I could ascertain it was safe, uh, asked the man if he wanted to get in the car so I could drive him further away and asked him if there was a hospital or something I could drive him to. But I, on my way to doing that and making sure that they couldn't get inside the car, I was yelling, why are you doing that? Why? Ah, oh, that Mexican, this and this and that. These are our people. He, you simply, you don't know. These are, uh, we've been in and out of each other's history for years. You don't know your history. These are, we are the same people, blah, 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 blah. That's what I was saying. Now, fast forward 15 plus years later, I hope that I would still have picked the man up and tried to get him out of danger because they were, they were coming back. However, I know that I wouldn't have tried to give that lecture that I just tried to give to them. What I'm trying to say is that a lot of times people who are, quote, unquote, less educated are closer to the truth than those of us who get educated out of it because we haven't been convinced that we don't see what it is that we're looking at. And I think that what these young black kids, even though the reaction to it was incorrect, Okay, I think that what they were seeing, and maybe what Floyd Mayweather was saying when he was saying that you know the the cats and dogs thing, or when he's fighting a Hispanic fighter, he puts on Mexican music and puts on a sombrero and stuff, is that he's recognizing that in the color caste system, relative to him, he is, I would say, relative to him, that those people are white and they mistreat him on the basis of color, although relative to other white people, they are not white. Relative to him, they are, and I think that's demonstrated by how much they cheered for Ortiz and his antics, you know, and so... I will, agree, I will agree with all of that. I will agree with what you... I believe that is how he thinks. Yes, I, I will agree with that. Okay. And, uh, well, I guess um, we kind of had this conversation, but it's probably the 17th time we've had this conversation, D-Train, but I'm inviting <laughs> your comments on that. <laughs> um. Like like I said, I I definitely think that's a rational, logical um, point of view of looking at things. 
I don't know if it's the, the I guess, the only way. Um, because we're, in, in here, I think you're getting into things that may not be so uh, true, false, on and off logic. Um, and you get into things with, where you, you crack into things that could be open to, I guess, different interpretations. Um, in my view, um, I, I can see what you're saying, um, definitely, because when Ortiz and Mayweather fought, um, the white people cheered for Ortiz. Um, so Ortiz, obviously, politically, is lighter than Mayweather. Um, but also, you could you could flip that script, and you can say that there are other factors that play into uh, this this caste system. Like when uh, about forty years back, when Ali fought uh, uh, the gentleman that just died, uh, Frazier. Frazier, yes, exactly. When Ali fought Frazier, and the white people supported Frazier. Um, you know, Ali was obviously. I, I think. I just, I just think sometimes I think that there's a multitude of factors that plays into your political lightness and darkness, rather than just your color. I think that obviously that is the the big factor, um, but that there are other factors playing into how politically light and how politically dark people are um, all around the planet, and I think that they function, um, they function in different ways in different places, just like you said. Uh, so I do agree with you that it probably wasn't worth your time uh, to try to give those black males, um, you know, that lecture on, you know, these are, you know, we're all the same people, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I definitely agree with that point. Um, and I do think that it's um, important to recognize that people, so-called Latinos, um, even some black Latinos, um, as we, we talked about earlier uh, with Alva Pujols, you know, even though they're still our brothers, I mean, in, in the context of white supremacy, America, 2012, you know, these factors, um, these factors contribute into whether a person is politically lighter and darker, or darker than us. So I, I think it's a multitude of factors. I guess is the big thing, the big point that I'm trying to say. I I, I have to agree there. Um, when Cree was talking about uh, the, our inability to show. Uh, the emotion we should be allowed to show after a sporting event. Um, it's not even just limited in my mind to black I know it's not limited to just black males. I remember the uh, scrutiny Randy Chastain came under in the World Cup when she ripped off her soccer uniform um, after she scored the game-winning goal uh, for the women's World Cup team. It was a white woman, but she was told immediately when she did that, that's not what white women do. Are you crazy? Did you Did you do what? So, like you said, the the it's sometimes some of those things pop up in a moment. Um, I believe, you know, I I really believe that Slay Mayweather, um, and him in particular, does his best to. I believe, like Chris said, in his mind, he looks at it like you know, in this hierarchy, I'm more. I, I hate to say it, but I'm more of a nigger than this. Uh, then Pacquiao is, and I'm, cause that's how they're treating me, and you know, and that's why, I, and I'm not saying that he's wrong in how he's seeing it and how he's perceiving it, um, because I can see why he perceives it that way. I just like, I, like I said, he very I was, well may be, he very well 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 may be correct. I'm correct, right? Not, yeah, I'm definitely conceding that. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, that's why I, I guess that's why I said, like I said earlier, I just uh, pray that he in life, in, in all facets of life, walk carefully because he upsets people by being free to a level that most of us aren't. Um, and I, from what I've always been witnessed and from what my parents who are, you know, in their 60s, they've always told me when a black person starts to live a, a freeness in their life, that rubs them right, a, lot of right, a lot of white people the wrong way <laughs> and makes you a target. Oh, because the whole, yes, absolutely, your parents are absolutely correct, because the whole purpose of the system is to confine us. It's a prison. That's the whole point. <laughs> so, uh, so so if, you're, if, you're, if you seem to be uh, escaped or at perhaps behaving as if you're free, you, you must be captured and put back in prison, the prison of white supremacy. And that may be literal, 
you know. They may actually right. be put you behind bars. Uh, and in fact, LBM and I, on a very recent program, she actually had to school me about, you know, you'd think it, it, at this point in my life I'd know better. But that's something that my parents were lax and did not school me on. I don't, and I said at the time, I don't think they knew, that um, I'm not allowed to show peace, act as if I feel I'm at peace. Peace will be disturbed, which means that you can't be too happy. You can't be too serious. You have to look like you. I, I mean, I can completely. Uh, I, I can only say that my mother was born and raised in Mississippi. From day one of my life, I was told as a black man, you never walk out of the house and appear too happy or too sad. You're kidding! Your parents told you that explicitly. I mean, my really? mother. I mean, I can I can, I can say that with you know with full confidence. My mother is the youngest of eight children, and she was born in 1950, so she grew up. Going and seeing the photos of Emmett Till published in the magazine, and knowing boys that had gotten hung and stuff like that. So in her mind, uh, you know, a black man was never, never supposed to go out in that world and be too up or too down. Too down, they'll find a reason to push you down further. Too up, and they'll find a reason to knock you down. See, these are the kinds of lessons we. Uh, these are the kinds of lessons that used to be, I guess, routine. That. Uh, we just don't get any more. And I, I, I only want—I'm sorry—I don't even mean to cut you off because it's weird. This conversation, all things about sports. Jim Brown was always famous for saying he never showed any emotion on a football field. Um, the NFL was a lot more white in those days. But he said, no matter how hard he was hit, no matter if he was hurt, no matter if his ribs were broke, he got up with the same look on his face every single time because he was never going to let that white man know he was hurt. You know, and yet even that takes a toll because it's yeah, not. Because we're, we're not that's built the type of conditions they play under. It's they're not, allowed. They're allowed to, try to show pain. To show, you know, I mean, you, like you said, that you have to believe it takes a toll. Jim Brown played nine years in the NFL. So yeah, I'm sure it took his toll. Hmm. Okay. I've run out of sports topics, so if you guys have some, go ahead. But, yeah. Uh, okay, I have one. Uh, There's something me and Gus discussed, as well as I discussed this with other people. Uh, this is the first year anniversary, in my opinion, of the most of the worst yet most obvious white supremacist decision in sports history. I'd just like to know what did each of you feel when Sylvester Stallone was inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame? <laughs> what? what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and mind you, he met, he met, there was very little anger white folks about been this. Looking, white folks been looking for Rocky Marciano for about 50, 60 years. <laughs> so I guess they figured, you know, a made-up one would do. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to put that as my Facebook status. <laughs> you know, when... That's the best question I've heard all now. <laughs> You know, when when I heard that, <laughs> you know, you you hear something, you're just like, nah, this this can't be for real. This 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 is not true. This is a gag, right? <laughs> I thought it was. I thought it wasn't serious. I I thought it was a joke. I I honestly did. I didn't think it was serious until I actually saw the induction. And <laughs> I, I really don't I have think- anything to say. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, I just think Rocky is just blatant white supremacy. I mean, Rocky, just just take the last one when he was this old dude fighting this black male named Mason Dixon. Mason Dixon. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I y'all, I mean, y'all brothers are sports fans. Y'all know I ain't telling y'all nothing, man. They've been looking for a white champion for. Um, and the weird, and the weird thing about it is. I guess this is one of those times white people in this country are xenophobic because 
they don't take to the Klitschko brothers, who have dominated the I heavyweight mean, championship for five right. years. Why? Now I've always wondered that. Can do you have a do you have a thought as to why? Is it because they're Russian? That's probably what I'm thinking. I mean, for some reason, I guess that Cold War mentality is. Is it that it's still it's still in it's still in them because I'm I'm not old enough. I'm only twenty eight, so I can be honest to say that I'm really not old enough to be of the Cold War you know, of the of that Cold War era. Is it that strong? I didn't I think, think it so. was. I didn't think it was, but you would just have to you would just have to believe that the reason Because that's a great question. The you right, the Crisco brothers ain't never got no love in America. Yeah. I mean there have been other white fighters from other countries that were immediately accepted, even yeah, when they were failed. Like Andrew Galata, you know, white people True. loved him until. True. I mean, so he had both. Let me let me. Uh, let, this is why I had to read. I wouldn't have had an answer for that. I wouldn't have had an answer for, for, for that uh, a month ago. But or five months ago, at the time that I was doing research for the program in which I was citing census statistics for how well the different people at the various castes in the various castes in this country were doing this part of the world called the United States were doing economically, I was doing some research, and so most of it I was doing on the U.S. census site. But there was one place I was going where I was taking statistics from a group that uh, it was it was. They build themselves as an Asian American group, and they were comparing uh, their English fluency to their educational and the educational levels, and I think uh, income levels and wealth levels of various immigrant groups. And they were able to get information from uh, they were they put it into four different categories because that's how they were finding it. And as they were finding the ca categories for the four basic immigrant groups as to how they were doing in those four areas, it was broken down by white people like this: Europeans, uh, Hispanics. Uh, Af African de African descendant, and the fourth one, surprise, surprise, was Russian. Mm. Mm. And yes, and I later, and I don't think it's about Cold question, Warism. Yeah. I don't think it's about Cold Warism at, at all. Even if you look at how things are lining up geopolitically right now, you wouldn't have expected Russia to line up behind Iran, but they are. Okay, in terms of this, uh, you got you got uh, Israel, you've got Europe, and you've got the United States lining up uh, behind, you know, obviously Israel and against Israel. Iran. Right. But Russia and China, which you would have never expected, Russia and China are backing Iran. And I've talked to a couple of people about this, and the only conclusion that I can reach is that they're correct, which is that this is the reason that that Hitler. Uh, went to war because the line was drawn at Russia. Russia oh, yeah. is considered a group of mixed race people. A lot of they them are. don't have they are. Yeah, they're, they are. they're considered Can a lot of them are considered Asiatic. Yes, go ahead. Oh, um actually in the rising tide of color, um by Lothar Stoddard, um Russia is actually in the yellow category. Um they are there not <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I mean, well, I mean, let's let's just be honest, because I was I was about to add that you crazy you took the word out of my mouth and figuratively, uh, you know, Russia sits in Asia, <laughs> and, right, you know, right, right. So that that's truly what they are. Uh, now, what you when you pointed that they came listed as a separate group from white people, now that struck me. I had never would have never guessed that. Now, that obviously, is, sorry. No, I, I, I was, was just going to say, say obviously they are white Russian um, because they have, you know, white supremacist, neo-Nazi activity um, against the non-white people um, in Russia, the so-called right. Asians from the caucus and stuff like that. So they are right. white Russian, but the vast majority of Russians, I would have to conclude, um, white people, um, the most powerful white people don't see as white. Okay. 
like I said, I, I, I'm, young, I'm so I'm younger than the Cold War era, essentially. So I mean, this is a learning <laughs> conversation for me, because that is truly uh, a new find for me. Uh, the whole Cold War, war I think, is not is a is a misnomer, uh, because who's ever heard of such a thing? I would say, right. having lived through it very clearly. Uh, it was a pretend war. <laughs> Cause we oh, I agree with you on that. <laughs> it was a war. war. Oh. Yeah. Really? Yeah, they weren't um, really. I mean, everything I ever read about it led me to that same conclusion, but I didn't live through it, so I never wanted to make that statement. <laughs> well, well, they but would have sworn you up and down. They didn't mean it wasn't, but it was, yeah. Mm. From what I've observed, um, from what I've observed, the Cold War is basically, um, and like I said, I, I'm not, you know, I, I just study history a lot. Uh, the Cold War was basically a fight between uh, the Eastern Bloc of white people, which are white Russians, and I guess the Asiatic Russians uh, that are associated with white Russians. Uh, right. And Western white people. Um, That's what I always and, gathered it as. And what happened is there were a, pretty much the Cold War was a bunch of proxy wars where the Western Bloc of white supremacy were fighting the Eastern Bloc of white supremacy, but they were using non-white soldiers to fight non-white soldiers to do it. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's, so that's Vietnam, what I like Vietnam, Korea, um, Central America, places in Africa, uh, Cuba, all of these were related to the Cold War and. All of these places um, had uh, were countries with populations where I, with large numbers of people who I would say um, I think even the the Russians would say and that the Western white people would say were not white. Right. Okay. Yeah, and in fact, they were fighting over control of those people. That's really what it was about. It was about a turf war. And, and that's always the sense I kind of got. I just I just need to know from somebody who lived through it whether or not that sense was accurate. <laughs> Well, I lived through it, and uh, I, I would say your sense is accurate. I would say that. And I also wanted to say, uh, D-Train, that I agree with you that there are a number of factors that go into. Uh, and I thought that the example that you gave about Ali versus Frazier was, was an excellent one to demonstrate that the factors that go into determining who's white and who's not white um, are are multiple. And uh, obviously, skin color and facial characteristics are a big part, but they're not the only one. And in fact, someone said, we're kind of getting away from the sports thing again, so if somebody can help bring it back to it, I'd, I'd certainly appreciate it. I want to try to be crisp and, and, and uh, consistent. But someone had said, but, but, but then again, the main thing I always want to discuss is the system of racism, white supremacy, and how to counter it. Someone had, had said to me recently, it was on Facebook, actually, uh, that if we're talking about and I, I'm going to say, I'd say I agree with it. Not that it's, it's on the borders of it, but the borders are important because they define something. That there are a tiny, one would almost say negligible percentage of people who appear white in every way, uh, phenotypically, but who are not white neurologically, meaning to say that their instinct, their way of being in the world, their natural hostility towards uh, people who are not white, you know, how, however you define that internally, neurologically, and so on, uh, they can look that way, but, then, but, that, but that they're not. And if somebody proposed that this is, this is kind of dealing with sports, it's not really sports, but it's entertainment. Somebody told me that they thought that possibly Robin Thicke was one such person. I said, while I might theoretically agree with you that such people agree in a very, very negligible, very, 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 very negligible way, I don't think Robin Thicke is one such example. But um, the point of that was what? Oh, was that, uh, you know, quite possibly you could reach some very, you could have some very dark-skinned athletes uh, who white people are just a lot more comfortable with because even though they look dark, uh, there's something about the way that they behave and something that they sniff in them and their behavioral system and so on that's more like more akin to their own instincts. But I, I guess I that, uh, yeah, that, that is true. The uh, perfect example of that was Kobe Bryant prior to the uh, rape charges. You know, yeah, definitely. You know, uh, and and he had 
And mind you, he has some of his own issues, but if you remember, there were constant articles about him being a quote-unquote good guy as opposed to other basketball players that, you know, were hip-hop and, you know, wore their hair in braids, whereas he was clean-cut, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. Then the rape allegations, or in my opinion, the setup between Caitlin Faber and her boyfriend on him, that happened. And the press conference immediately after that he gave was, was very telling. I'll never forget it. He pleads his case. He's innocent. Has his wife next to him. And then he makes the statement, y'all know me. Y'all know I'm not like that. Wow. Uh, well, see, I, I mean, I, I'm going to take it back. Yeah. <laughs> Kobe Bryant was warned years before that race. His, his daddy warned him what he was going into. Most people don't even remember this, but Kobe Bryant was alleged to have raped his wife. Yeah, that, was why, that was why he had to marry. I remember that. That's why he had to marry, he had had to marry her. her. That's why yeah. he had to marry her, because he slept with her when she was 16. Wow. Which I, which I fully believe. Because his daddy, that's when his parents moved out of L.A. That's when his parents moved out of his house in L.A. and back to Philadelphia. Because his parents both told him, don't marry that girl. Take whatever's going to come to you, whoever. They can prove it. They can prove it. But let them prove it. Don't marry that girl. You in for something. And that girl's father. His wife? Her, step, her stepfather. His mama divorced him and took everything he got. And he told Kobe that <laughs> that was the game plan for them two chicks. Just was curious. Talking. Does anybody know? Um, I, I'm kind of confused. Um, what Kobe Bryant's wife's racial classification is? See, see, that's that is a good question. He's to this half day, Hispanic. I believe he's half. That? Mexican. <laughs> okay, go ahead, sir. Please see. No, I've, I've always sorry. I've all I've heard four different stories. <laughs> So to this day, I really can't say. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know what the, what <laughs> she is per se. I do know that just my from my personal opinion, that boy was a fool for marrying her from day one. He he needed to have listened to his daddy. <laughs> yeah, and now <laughs> I agree. And now the ten year period has been reached, so you know what and, that means. And if he filed for divorce at 10 years and six months, that is nothing but a setup. And he, 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 you know, his daddy played in the NBA. I'm from 100% sure his daddy knew what kind of games them kind of women ran. And had foreign Kobe, boy, <laughs> this ain't the one. Was that the prenup? The prenup said that if she made it to 10 years, she got half? No, she don't got a prenup. There is no prenup. Oh, that's because right. That's there is what no the, rumor, the rumor was. Supposedly, the rumor was that he was strong armed into marrying her without a prenup, or they were going to file statutory rape charges against him. Right, I heard that. Wow. I, somebody yeah, posted, that was the rumor. Uh, somebody actually. And it's posted, looking to be true 10 years later. I mean. Somebody did post, uh, and I've forgotten it, it, was, it looked very credible to me. Uh, they posted who her stepfather was, who her biological mother was, is and who her biological father was. And so her biological father and her biological mother are of quote-unquote Mexican ancestry, but that doesn't speak to her racial classification, right? I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, so I, I, I've gotten to the point where, you know, if I have to do a quick and dirty, I do it by how they look. You know, uh, if a, a, a right. still photo. I'd rather see my next level of quick and dirty is let me see how you move. <laughs> Not just how you look. I, you, don't, you don't have to talk. You act, just right. How you act, you know. I just want to see how you how move you your head. That, well, but that, well I'm, doing, I'm talking about quick and dirty first, right? But thirdly, uh, it is how you function. And what uh, 
uh, Ed Williams did an amazing uh, experiment, which I've not been able to replicate. I haven't even tried. But he did an amazing um, experiment on counterracism.com, and I'll have to run that commercial before we run out of our nine minutes here. But this, is, this really speaks to it, and I think it's going to be very important as we begin to talk about who the personalities are running the business of sports entertainment into the future as to who is and who is not white. But he did an amazing experience, experiment, and what he did was he uh, picked a corner, an intersection, and uh, he would ask people if they would participate when they were about to cross the street. And he would say, would you please look at the person across the street and tell me if that's a white person or a non-white person? And uh, then when the person would come across the street, uh, the person would either identify themselves as white or non-white, and then there would also be somebody on the other side who was a white person who would say whether or not this person was white or non-white. So you had to have uh, the corroboration. The person had to identify themselves as white, and then there would be a person across the street who would either corroborate or not corroborate that the person was white or non-white. If you got the corroboration, the person was white. Now, that having been said, if that was clear, is that clear so far? Yes. Yes. Okay. What they found is that <clears throat> the if the person was white, they got it right 100% of the time. From across the street, if the person who was asked to look to judge from across the street was not white, they only had about a 70% uh, accuracy rate. Wow. So, <laughs> so there and is they, something. Go ahead. Oh, um, I, I definitely would like, uh, well, I, can, I can search Mr. Williams' channel for it, but um. I would. Uh, were all of the people in this experiment like racially ambiguous um, that he chose some, all of the people? No, no, not all of them were, but some of them were, and I guess that's that's the point. The ones that were racially ambiguous, I guess those were the those were the ones that the black people or the people who weren't white got wrong most of the time, but the white uh, people got it right every time. So uh, there's something that they're looking at that we don't see, and I and I suspect that it has something to do with it's not just a look it's not just about phenotype or your physical look no it's, it's not some, it's something about a carriage because i can tell um well you know in the same way that uh um well, most people can tell you know in the same way that maybe the child doesn't look like they're down syndrome but you know there's something quite not right about that child you know that child's got special needs just by looking at them even if they don't you know, just by looking at, watching the mood just a little bit, you can say, something not white right about that kid. I, I, or, you know, there's something kind of different about that kid. I think that that's how white people tell. I can, I will say I can, I'm unfamiliar with the study until you um, made me aware of it. I can say I can agree. And I will only add one, and, and this is purely from personal experience. I believe that that is in certain black people, I will say one from the deep south. Um, my mother, and this is just personal experience, my mother is very, very fair. Um, absolutely light. fair. You, you don't, you don't mean fair, but you meant light, right? Light, you meant yes. light. Okay. That's, I'm sorry, that's the term that I'm always, that's me that I've always grown up using. Um, right. But light, she's very light-skinned. And, um, and she is the lightest of her sisters. She has eight sisters. She was the lightest of them. Her mother was even lighter than her. Her mother, to the eye, looked white. Um, my mother has always said, which what that, what that essentially what Ed Williams' study is, that you know, white folks can always tell when when they ain't a white person. And black folks are always the ones struggling to figure out who makes and who this and who that and that. And my mom used to always, my mom used to always say, "What you say, it, it come down to that quick and dirty. How do they carry themselves? How do they act? How do they function in this world?" And you look at them, and it's easy to tell that ain't no brother, that ain't no sister. Oh, definitely. And I hate to say that, you know, but as you make me aware of that study, it's like, wow, mom, really? <laughs> I have to call you and tell you you're probably right about that. One. <laughs> And the blue Cree, I believe I've told you this story about my uh, my, my grandparents, uh, well, my whole mother's side of my family, very, very light-skinned people. Um, and, you know, they have cousins who are 
who uh, I, I've, I've talked to my grandmother about this, and I said, well, do you think that your, your cousin is a white person? And she said, yes. And then she said, do you think that, and I asked, you know, do you think that your cousin is a white supremacist? And she said, yes. Uh, you know, born of the same stock. That's um, very true. Or whatever. Yeah, I can, I can but, co-sign that from my own family experiences. That's very true. Yeah, but they, they grow up and they end up functioning differently. They choose to function in a different manner. Yeah, it is very true. I I can admit that there are people in my family who have chosen the past. Now, see, the question comes to me, and this is unsettled. Uh, I, I, this is this is my my current in, uh, area of interest, as they say in academia and of research, is whether or not the choice to function that way is uh, genetically programmed, because. Um, well, I, 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 have a, I have a hypothesis, so obviously I have a, a bias, but I'm, I'm going to wait till it scientifically pr- uh, bears itself out. Uh, there, there's a way of functioning in the world. There's a certain instinct and nature towards the world that I think those people who classify themselves as white, who practice white supremacy, have. It's in their, pro- their, their genes are programmed for that kind of behavior. And so while it may seem like a choice to function that way, it's an easy place to plug in because their, their machinery works that way. And, it, and, and as you say, it can come from the same stock because DNA can re- do what's called recombination. So you've got a lot of genes floating around, including genes that determine personality and behavior and so on. And so it can recombine uh, it in one way, in one offspring, and in another, uh, in another offspring. And it, it's rare. But it's but by the same token, you know, you've seen those those twin studies where you've got these fraternal twins where one child comes out phenotypically white and with the behavior of white of a white child, and you can see that behavior at three years old. I think these uh, if you look at the uh, I think it's called the Leyden Leyden Caden something like that. They're in the UK uh, okay. studies and. Not only does the one child look white, but as she begins to, to describe his behavior, it is very much like a white person, like a white child, like a white supremacist, and it's at three or four years old. And the and the and the and the black child be, behaves as a child, like a black black kid. So I I don't know how much of that even 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 if they come from the same mother and father, the way the genes can recombine can cause I think different type of behavior. So for me. Ultimately, it does come down to behavior. It does come down to behavior. Uh, it, the, I'm not going to spend a lot of time waiting to see how they behave before I decide if they're white. If I, if you, if I, if you could be white and I don't have time to see, you know what I mean? I'm gonna, I'm gonna <clears throat> just, I'm, you're white. I'm sorry, that's the way it goes. <laughs> but, uh, but there are times when it's, you know, if, if you, if you hang around long enough, I can tell whether or not uh, you're white or not. I can't do it as fast as a white person, obviously. Um, right, and, and 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 I I no longer. You know, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to stop calling them white people. I, I'm I, I'm coining my term. I'm using my term, oxyhominoid. Yeah. So I I can't tell an oxyhominoid as quickly as another oxyhominoid. But um, M1, you've been really good at tying the tying the threads together and making it relate to the topic of the program. So I'm I'm asking you if you can do it now before we go out. Oh, we've only got 40 seconds. You know what? I'm going to have to – I had no idea I took that that much time talking. Let me thank our guest tonight, Richard Lawrence, a sports management professional. Please check out his his Facebook page, Young, Black, and Married. It's linked on the episode page. Thank you, M1, always a fantastic and uh, thoughtful supporter and participant. And D-Train, same thing here. And please check out his show, Reckless 2.0. You can find that in the search field at Blog Talk. Radio uh, for Saturday, December 24th. This has been the Counter Races Evolving Engineer Show, signing out. <laughs>